When you think about school, it's easy to think of it like a building or a classroom. Desks and chairs, busy hallways, piles of books, and that place where you go just to learn. There's the fear of fitting in, not being cool enough, or even the horrors of crossing the finish line last. But once you get there and discover that the ground on which you stand is not just about education or just about grades, diplomas, or competitions, your eyes open to a whole new world and that world comes to life. Here at Bermuda Institute, it's about people reaching people, making deeper connections through the common thread that runs throughout our veins, the love of Christ. When we realize that we are all loved and equal in His eyes, that love spreads like a wildfire. It's contagious. Within these walls, we learn from the best. Teachers who share a common goal that leads us through paths destined to the highest heights of success. Not just in academia, social, physical, or mental wellness, but also in the spiritual. We pray together, we learn together, we grow together, we discover together. There are books, there are classrooms, there are tests, but there's a very important part you can't put on paper. It's truly living, living as God created us to. It's servanthood. It's making healthy choices and working together to gain something so much bigger than this world has to offer. It's the relationships. It's laughter. It's the chapel service. It's good conversations with good friends. It's expressing who we are. It's hard work, but lots of fun. So we go to Bermuda Institute for the education, but in the end, what we take away is the experience of a lifetime, an experience for eternity. Experience Bermuda Institute. Pathfinders, get ready for the biggest international camporee ever. Join 55,000 Pathfinders in an all new location in Wyoming. In 2024, get ready for bigger campgrounds, more world records, special events, and incredible new activities. Join Pathfinders from all over the world and participate in daily parades, trade pins, earn honors, witness inspiring live evening programs featuring the story of Moses, and most of all, grow closer to Jesus Christ. Don't miss the 2024 International Pathfinder Camporee in Gillette, Wyoming.
Good morning, good morning, good morning, and a happy and blessed Sabbath to you. What an honor to be in God's house one more time. What a privilege to be here to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And this is the best place that you can be because God has promised that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. And so there are more than two or three gathered right here in the studio. And wherever you are, even if you are by yourself, as long as the Holy Spirit is there with you, that's right. You are good. So be thankful. Be blessed. It is a rainy, rainy day here in Bermuda. The winter has started to show up, guys. <laughs> winter is making its appearance. That's right. It's a little cool. We've got our umbrellas, raincoats, galoshes, whatever. But as long as we are thankful for the rain that is falling, because we sure do need it. The, the rain of God that falls into our lives, we are even more and more and more thankful for. So I want you to do something for me. We're going to do it early because we have so much we want to share with you. So we want you to press like, share, and subscribe because by doing that, you partner with us in being a digital disciple and taking the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world because that is our gospel commission. That is why Lagos University exists, so that men and women, boys and girls, have the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. They may not have had an opportunity any other way. And so we're thankful that God has allowed us to be here, where we have an in-depth, exhilarating study of his word, and we are able to do that week by week, only because of his grace. So we are going to go into song service. And so we will be blessed today with the voice of Sister Cynthia Tucker. And she is accompanied by her daughter, Sister Simone Otterbridge. And so Sister Tucker and Sister Otterbridge, good morning and a happy and blessed Sabbath to you. Take us to heaven's throne room. Good morning, saints. Good morning. We're going to start our song service with hymn number 367, number 367, Rescue the Perishing. This is part of our mission. Care for the dark. 
rescue the perishing duty demands it strength for thy labor the Lord will provide back to the narrow way patiently with them tell the poor wonder a Savior has died to the perishing care for the dying Jesus is merciful Jesus will save that's our mission to rescue the perishing this next song is number 306306 and is draw me nearer I want to use this as a prayer so those of you who know the words or may need the words, sing it prayerfully. Draw me nearer, nearer to the cross where thou hast died. Sister Otterbridge for your ministry in song this morning. Rescue the perishing and draw me nearer. Those 
are the songs that remind us of our commission. We have a message to tell to the world, to tell them of a savior who came and died, who lived as our example, and who died for our sins. And he wants them to know that he loves them more than anything. And we have that message to share to the world. What is our mission to our neighbor? And how do we do that? Well, that is the study for today. So we are so glad that you have joined in. And so before we have Deacon Craig out of Bridge Pray. I want to remind you that our prayer warriors are standing by. We are here to take your prayers to the throne room of God and to lay them there at his feet. And we do not pray in vain. We pray knowing that we serve a prayer answering God. And who can testify to the fact that God has indeed answered your prayers. So I want you to send your prayer request to intercessorsbda at gmail.com. Our prayer warriors are standing by. And if not, you could send them right here in the chat. We will make sure that they receive them. And those of us who are here and monitor the chat, we will be praying for you as well. We want to hear about how God is answering your prayers. So please put your prayer requests and your answers in the chat. Well, we are going to go right into our lesson study for today. And Brother Craig Otterbridge will have our opening prayer. And our panel are in the persons of Deacon Craig Otterbridge, Elder Garth Dixon, and Deacon Steve Doyling. Gentlemen, good morning and a happy Sabbath to you. And we have our most abled moderator in the person of Elder Joswan Smith, our head elder, who will take you into the lesson study discussion. And this one is always one of those ones where mm, when the rubber really meets the road as to how it is that we go out and we share the gospel of Jesus Christ to our neighbors. So if you're having that challenge after this lesson, we shouldn't. The gentleman will help us to be able to take these truths and apply them to our lives that we may be about our father's business. And so Deacon Craig, have our opening prayer. Yes, good morning everyone, let us pray. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, as you have said, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will rain down in this place. Father, encourage our hearts and our words that we speak, that they may lift you up, and that those that are listening will be edified and drawn closer to you. Father, we pray for all those who are suffering loss and um, who have faced major trials and tribulations mm -hmm. this week. Father, we know that you are able. So we ask that you would draw close to them, speak to them, encourage them, Father, hold them up, and that they may know <clears throat> that we serve a risen Savior who is a prayer answering God. Let this be our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Enjoy the lesson study discussion for today.
Uh, good morning, good morning, and happy Sabbath to every one of you out there. So awesome and wonderful to be with you again. Good to see you all uh, on the chat. Uh, Sister Paveo, we just want to let you know we are praying for Albert. Uh, God is with Albert. God is with him. We know our God loves him with an everlasting love, and he is certainly uh, with Albert even now. And uh, Sister Robinson, we're going to pray. Absolutely. You keep, you keep staying in the Word of God, and that certainly will deepen uh, your relationship with Jesus Christ, because we remember you in prayer. All of you out there, uh, we want to say God bless you. Thank you for joining us. For those of you who may not know, you have joined uh, here, us here at Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church in Little Island of Bermuda. Uh, we're experiencing some stormy, ra rainy weather today, but God is still good. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as Brother Craig prayed earlier, that there are many who have suffered loss. And uh, I just want to let... I mean, there are so many. Over the past two weeks, uh, there are just so many young people, young people, and one of them uh, in particular is a neighbor of mine, um, just young people, you know, our age, brother, our age, who are passing away. And uh, so many people are left wondering, what, what's going on? What's going on? There's so many young people dying uh, in recent, recent times. So we want to just extend our condolences and send our love to all of you out there who are experiencing loss, particularly when they are uh, very young people. I mean, it's said when every, anyone is lost, but, you know, when young people die, it just seems like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be, you know. But um, may God continue to comfort and bless every one of you. Well, we've got to get into this lesson. Very interesting lesson uh, because I believe that God is trying to get a message to His people. I mean, it seems as though all the sermons we've heard this year uh, the Sabbath school lessons, everything is bringing us to this place where God is trying, I believe God is trying to tell His church, it's time to work on our deep personal issues. It's time to actually begin to live out this everlasting gospel. And today He reminds us, listen, uh, the everlasting gospel has really, from the beginning, been about saving all mankind. Every single person, the people you like, the people you dislike, everybody, this gospel is designed to reach out to them, to get them to be saved and they have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I believe God is trying to get us to understand this. And right off the bat, mission to my neighbor. Mission to my neighbor is this week's Sabbath school lesson. But brothers and sisters, I absolutely love this uh, opening text, this opening text in Luke chapter 10 and verse 27, Luke chapter 10 and verse 27, and it says, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I, I, I zone in on this word, all, all, with all your heart. And you know what? The world today seems to think that it's okay that we give him some of our heart uh, when we're out during the week and then give him the other part of our heart on Sabbath when we come to church. But that's not, that's not how this command happens. This word, all, it's very serious. It means every single part Leave out no part from God. Hide nothing from God. Give it all. The word heart here, the word heart is the Hebrew word cardia. And it means the center of all, there's that word again, of all physical and spiritual life, of the will and character. So what is he saying here? Love the Lord thy God with Every bit of your will, any, any strength that you have to will to do something, love God with all of it. Put all your will to serve God. And character, whatever you, all of your character. Love God with all your character, with all your will, with every spiritual and physical uh, thing that is the center of your life. It goes on to say, and with all your soul. Here it is. This word soul, suke. Suke means breath of life. I thought that was interesting. 
that in which there is life. Huh? In other words, love the Lord your God with every breath that you take because the breath that you breathe belongs to God. Mercy, huh? In this context, you see the word so doesn't mean something floating around. It simply means the very breath of life that God has given you. Love Him with all of it. Every breath. Amen. And then it says, with all your strength. Iskus. Iskus. It means ability and might. So any ability, gifts, talents, whatever you have, love the Lord your God with all of it. Don't dedicate that to the, to the devil. Don't give that gift, that might, that strength uh, uh, to the devil, that talent you have. Don't give it to him, but love the Lord thy God with all of it. And then this last part, you should love the Lord thy God with all your mind. This word mind is dianoia. Dianoia. It means way of thinking. Woo. You got to love the Lord thy God with all your mind, with all your thoughts, every, the way you think, you should love God with the way you think. This is deep. This is very deep. It says, the way of thinking and feeling. Mercy. Huh? Remember, we're talking about loving your neighbor. Stay in tune with it. And we're going to get to, to the panelists in just a second. It means thoughts, faculty of understanding. So you need to love the Lord your God with all your understanding, with every bit of your faculties, with every feeling and a way of thinking. Here it comes now. And your neighbor as yourself. See, the prerequisite for loving your neighbor as you love yourself is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and all your strength. Dedicate all of that to God and loving your neighbor will happen automatically. I believe that's what God is trying to tell us. Don't pretend in front of your neighbor to make them think that you love God. No, no, no. We got to do that the opposite way because many of us come to church pretending to love our neighbor so that the neighbor can think that we love God. But what this scripture is telling us is no, no. God comes first. Love God with all that you are, with every breath that you take, with every thought that you think. Love God because when you do that, loving your neighbor is an automatic response of your love for God. And so as we go into this lesson, I just wanted to lay that foundation. As we go into this lesson, we need to remember how much do we need to give to God before we can be seen to love our neighbors as ourselves? So brothers and sisters, we got to get into this lesson. The question of all questions, the question of questions, Elder Garth is going to take us into this lesson. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 28. The question of questions. Take us there, Elder. Amen. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do and thou shalt live. You know, in our journey as Christians, our ultimate aspiration is to emulate the character of Jesus. And throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus faced numerous challenges and encountered opposition to his divine mission. Now, what sets him apart is not only how he dealt with these challenges, but the profound wisdom, relatable teaching, emphasis on love and compassion, and affirmation that were the principles that characterized his responses. Now, as followers of Christ, we are not exempt from challenges. Yet, like Jesus, 
we are called to navigate them with the same wisdom and compassion. Our faith is not merely about providing surface level answers, my friends, but about guiding people toward a deeper understanding of God's truth. The mandate to, in, to be intentional witnesses is rooted in the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Jesus commands us to actively engage with people and share the transformative message of salvation. Additionally, in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus describes us as the light of the world, urging us to shine brightly in our actions and words, glorifying God. In 1 Peter 3, in verse 15, we are encouraged to always be prepared to articulate the hope within, within us, engaging others with gentleness and respect. Colossians 4, 5 to 6, reinforces the idea of walking in wisdom, making the best use of our time and seizing everyday interactions as opportunities to share Christ's love. So the question then is, how do we Pardon me. So the question then is, how do we effectively seize opportunities for witnessing much like Jesus did? Colossians 4, 5 to 6 advises us to walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time, and to let our speech be gracious and seasoned with salt. Similarly, 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 urges us to be prepared to give a defense of our hope with gentleness and respect. Now, let's draw inspiration from some biblical examples to see how seizing opportunities for witnessing, as Jesus did, can be lived out in our daily lives. In Acts 16, 25 to 34, despite being imprisoned, Paul and Silas seized the moment in our lives, this can translate into finding opportunities in challenging situations, whether it's a comforting a colleague in a tough time or sharing the hope of Christ during personal struggles. Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John 4, 4 to 26. Here, Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well teaches us to see the potential for meaningful conversations in everyday situations. We too, my friends, can engage in conversation about the fa our faith during routine activities, such as waiting in line or even chatting with a neighbor. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, 26-39. Philip's responsiveness to the Holy Spirit's prompting shows us, my friends, the importance of being attuned to the leading of the Holy Spirit. As we go about our daily lives, let's be open to divine nudges, recognizing the opportunities for meaningful conversations and sharing the gospel. And finally, in conclusion, the love for God and others emphasized in Luke 10 and verse 25 should shape our interactions with God, the church, and other individuals. By adopting the mindful approach of Jesus and drawing inspiration from these practical examples in Scripture, we can be effective witnesses in our everyday lives. Friends, let's be intentional, wise, and ready to share the transformative love of Christ, even in less than ideal circumstances we may encounter. Amen, amen, Brother Goff. You know, <clears throat> when I look at that, that concept about our everyday conversations. One of the reasons why I believe it's so important for us to have these everyday conversations is because every person, every person I believe on this planet 
is actually asking the question. They may not ask it out loud, but I believe every heart wants to know, uh, and, and, and the lesson points it out right at the beginning. Every heart wants to know, who, who are we exactly? You know, why, why am I here? You know, scientists today, that's the big question. They want to find out why we're here, where did we come from, who, who we are, what's our purpose, right? These are the kinds of questions that I believe every heart desires to know because people get up every day trying to find that answer. They try to find their place in life. That's why some of us, you know, some, I believe that's why some of us sometimes uh, treat others badly. It's because of that question. We're trying so hard to find our purpose and meaning and, and value that we begin to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We begin to treat others in a way that lifts us to a place where we, where we believe that we have greater meaning than the next person. I hope, I'm, I hope I'm trying to be clear of that. You know what I mean? So in other words, we are trying to answer the question of questions every day without even realizing what we're doing. We govern our lives every day trying to answer this question. I mean, scientists ask this question. And the thing about it is, the answer to the question has been here all along. And, and just going along with what Brother Garth was saying, we have the ability to answer the question for the world around us. So that rather than them getting up every day trying to figure out who they are and why they're here, and whether they are important, you know, they'll stop treating others less than themselves because they'll realize already their importance. They'll know already that Christ died for them. Someone died for them to save them. There's no need for you to prove your value. You are of much greater value than even you can prove for yourself. And so we have that answer. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. This idea that this man asked this question, uh, Brother Craig, Brother Steve, he asked this question, what must I do to have eternal life? Well, we know the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun because every single one of us who claim Jesus at this point, that's the same question we ask. That's why you're here. That's why you, you became a Christian. It's because you wanted, hey, what do I need to do to have eternal life, right? And so you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ in, and I'll just, in an attempt, <laughs> right, in an attempt to gain eternal life, yes? Well, there's nothing new under the sun. But here's the thing about, I recognized about the difference between, and a quote was sent to me, actually, when it was sent to me, oh, it made me smile. And the quote went something like this. The early church, the early church asked, what must I do? To be saved? Good question. But the modern church, <clears throat> today's church, asked, how much can I do <clears throat> and still be saved? Uh, that's what we want to ask you. you know, how much can I get away with, Lord, and still be saved? Brothers and sisters, we got to get back to the simplicity of the gospel. Just ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Because Jesus alone has the answer. Because if we, go to, if we come to Christ with this idea, how much can I get away with? How much can I still do and be saved? Then Christ is not giving you the answer at all. You're giving yourself the answer. Brother Craig, go right ahead. I, I, I like the way you were putting that out. Uh, and what came to my mind is that when he asked the question, um, what must I do to inherit eternal life? the idea that he wanted to inherit an eternal life in the same uh, life that he was living, that he wanted to take how his thoughts, his minds, and everything that he was doing and go and live in heaven with that. And mm -hmm. in order to get to heaven, we have to die. And we have to die to self. And without that happening, then we have no life here and we'll have no life there oh, either. Oh my goodness, absolutely. Because even in this same lesson, the question of questions, this same lesson, we realize that <clears throat> if we don't believe in the resurrection and we don't believe that someone has died to take away our sins and we don't hold on to that with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, if we don't love God, we don't follow this thing, 
then why in the world are we coming to church denying ourselves all manner of worldly pleasure, feeling guilty, going through all kind of foolishness, pretending in front of others so that they don't know that we sinned this week. We go through all this mess only to lose it all anyway? Tell me how much sense does that make? That's why if we say we're Christians, what we need to do is embrace it just like the scripture said, with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. Because if you try to half step, quarter step, third step, any kind of step less than 100%, it's all for nothing. You'll go through all of this and still lose heaven. It makes no sense. Either God be God and choose him or the devil is God and choose him. But don't try to be lukewarm because Christ will spew you out of his mouth anyway. So pretending is foolishness. It's useless. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't embraced your walk with Christ 100%, I'm here to warn you, it is useless. The little that you think you have and you pride yourself that you come to church and you, you read and you pray or you participate in some ministry or whatever, but you don't have the, the fullness of Christ. You don't have the love of God. If you're not embracing this thing in every corner and facet of your way you think and of your mind and your life, then you would have come all this way only to still lose heaven. I'm going to encourage us. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. So see, imagine God... The God of the new covenant. Here's something else I want to point out. The God of the new covenant, Jesus Christ, was the one asking him the question, was it not? But think about what this guy was doing. He, he answers the question. And Christ, you know, you, you, you answer right, brother. You got to do that. Love the Lord thy God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? But still trying to justify himself. He says, well, well, well who is my neighbor? as if Christ was going to give him an answer other than the full answer that he just, just gave him. So what do, how does that play out with us, brothers? Think about it. Many of us do the exact same thing. Oh, we do a lot of things to... I, you know what? Let me share this. Let me share this. We do a lot of things to gain eternal life. We go to church, we're studying, we're here today, we're doing all of this. But something, I'm just going to tell you something where God had to show me something. Whenever I was around beautiful women, brethren, huh? at least my idea of what beautiful women was, you know, whenever I was around beautiful women, I found that, you know, I never talked about Christ. <laughs> I never talked about Christ. I talked about all kinds of other things, my brother, but never Christ. Until one day the Lord spoke to me about that, he says, you're a wicked person. I said, wow, wow, Lord, I mean, that's, yeah, you're wicked. Every week you're attempting to go to heaven. You come to church, you study the word, you teach the word, you do all these things every single week. Yet around women you feel are beautiful, you're not going to tell them about Christ because just perhaps in the back of your mind, you think, well, I don't want them to know I'm a Christian because just in case, you know, some sinful thing could happen. I'm just being honest. I said, I'm not afraid of that. This is a real thing because many of you out there, I'm here to tell you this is the position you're in today. You don't tell them about Christ because in the back of your mind, there's something that says, if something goes down, at least they won't know I'm supposed to be a Christian. Huh? And the Lord said, that's evil. How could you attempt to get to heaven every week and yet not care about the salvation? Because beautiful women need Jesus Christ too. Huh? Brother Craig? I, I, I want to add to that. I don't, I don't think people work to get to heaven. I think people work for eternal friendships here on earth. They work for eternal smiles, eternal um, uh, comforts mm. that they might get around being, being around church people and, and there's, there's atmospheres. But that's only eternal for as long as they live. Because once they pass, all that works, all that remembrance is, is, is gone. It's, it's all in vain. It, it means absolutely nothing in the kingdom of heaven if it's not lifting up.
Christ. Amen. Amen. Brother Steve, did you want to get in on this one? All right, all right, no problem. But listen, I just want to let us know that we can't love ourselves to the point where we try to get to heaven, but not love our neighbor with the same desire to get to heaven. That's what I was talking about. Don't leave certain people out just in case. <laughs> brothers, I'm speaking to the brothers. Well, some of our ladies might be doing that too. But I'm speaking to the brothers. Don't do that. Everybody needs Jesus Christ. And in actual fact, the minute we did that, we just disqualified ourselves from eternal life. Thinking, well, as long as I'm going to church. You see, it's this God is after. It's the way we think. And at that point, I realized, God, I'm not all that I convinced myself that I am. Please, Jesus, take that from me. And by God's grace, I'm praising God. I'm praising God. Brother, it doesn't matter who I'm around today. Huh? <laughs> and they got to know who I am. I am a Christian. And I praise God for it because when we, when we embrace it with, with all that we have, you'll be shocked that the people you thought would think you're strange or the people you thought would sh shun you or move away from you because you're a Christian are the very same people say, oh, wow, really? You know, I've, I, 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 I was brought up in the church. You might get surprised because I've been surprised at some of the comments some of these ladies have said to me. Huh? And I said, wow, what a fool I was in my younger years. What a fool. They also wanted Jesus Christ, just needed someone, someone to come and say it. Brother Garth, that everyday conversation, you know what I mean? Because they're asking the same question that got you to surrender to Christ. What must I do to be saved? The world wants to know. We need to tell them. Amen? Amen. Well, <laughs> brothers, we got to move on to Monday's lesson. Brother Steve, take us to Jesus' method and response. Here we go. We just started to get into it a little bit yeah. just now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jesus' yeah. Method, <laughs> and method and response. Take us to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So when we look at Monday's lesson, Jesus' method and response, it's interesting to notice the difference people, the different people, the different reasons, all right, the different reasons why people chose to look for Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse, verses 1 and 21, it tells us, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Then we have John chapter 6, which tells us Jesus fed 5,000. And then in verses 24 to 26, it tells us, Once the crowd that Jesus fed realized that Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and went to Capernaum in search of him. They found him on the other side of the lake, and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, mm. but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And there we have in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it states, On one occasion, an, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, notice in all three of those occasions, no one addressed Jesus as the Messiah. Nevertheless, he was true to his word and method, which is found in John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus said, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whomever comes to me, I will never drive away. So if Jesus never ignored persons who came to him for a variety of reasons, why should we ignore them? It is also interesting to notice that social status, 
earthly credentials mm. and being born or raised in the church didn't qualify any of these individuals with a secure place in the kingdom of God. Mm. But it does show that we all qualify for the need to change. Yes. For it, for it wasn't the radical knowledge alone that each of them needed, but <coughs> spiritual regeneration. It wasn't that each of them needed their curiosity satisfied, but each of them needed a new heart. For we all must receive a new life from above before we can appreciate heavenly things. And then notice the mindset of Nicodemus, the people who found Jesus, and the lawyer. Even though he was one of Israel's teachers, Nicodemus was unaware of what it meant to be born again and connected to God spiritually. The people who found Jesus are recorded in John chapter 6 verse 28 saying they then asked him what must we do to do the works God requires. And we're told in the book of um, the book Desire of Ages on page 385 it states these people that went looking for Jesus their question meant what shall we do that we may deserve heaven? What is the price we are required to pay in order to obtain the life to come? Luke chapter 10 verse 25 says, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer's question reveals the fact that his concept of righteousness was entirely wrong. To him, as to most Jews of this day, gaining salvation was essentially a matter of doing those things that were prescribed by the scribes. Mm -hmm. Thus he considered that the one, sorry, thus he considered that one could earn salvation by works. So that's where we look at Jesus' method. He did not turn away anyone from, from receiving salvation. But let's look at Jesus' response to each of these. He told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 14, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The people who found Jesus, Jesus said in John 6, 32, Jesus said to them, Verily, sorry, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And then the lawyer, Jesus told in uh, Luke chapter 10 verse 26 he, a he asked him well what's written in the law mm -hmm. he replied how do you read it so Jesus response encouraged each of them to personally search the scriptures because he himself said in Matthew 4 verse 4 it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God and there we find this quote in Desire of Ages uh, page 390 as our physical life is sustained by food so our spiritual life is sustained by the word of God. And every soul is to receive life from God's word for himself. As we must eat for ourselves in order to receive nourishment, so we must receive the word for ourselves. We are not to obtain it merely through the medium of another's mind. We should carefully study the Bible. We should take one verse and concentrate the mind on the task of ascertaining the thought which God has put in that verse for us. We should dwell upon the thought until it becomes our own, and we know what saith the Lord. Yes, yes, Amen. Brother Steve, listen. I got to hit on something yes. here. And, and you, you start, you, you, you're going down that road, brother. That's what I'm grateful for. See, the thing about, when I first read this, and they used the word lawyer, I had a different perspective on what that meant. I was thinking about, you know, lawyers the way we think about lawyers today. But the reality is when I researched this word, the, 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 the issue in, in this word in terms of the Hebrew is that this person, and I'm just going to put it in today's terms, this person was a Christian. This, this person was a Sabbath school teacher. You know, he was a pastor. He was one who knew the law. So in other words, the, 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 the meaning behind this word lawyer is that he was an expert in the law of Moses and the prophets. He was an expert in these things. Imagine an expert, huh? a pastor then in today's terms, coming and asking, what must I do to have eternal life? 
That what helped me to understand why Jesus answered him the way he did. He said, what is written in the law? Because he was an expert of the very law. You know what I mean? So Jesus said, how do you read it? In other words, what's your understanding of what you read in the law? Huh? Because you certainly have it already. You're asking me a question you already have the answer to. So what's your motive really for asking me this question? Ah, see, God said the, the lesson points out Jesus knew what his intentions were. And I want us to understand when we go to Jesus and we, we have prayers about things while we're hiding something behind that prayer, when we understand our true motive, but we're asking Jesus for something, knowing that there is a separate a motive attached to that, just understand Jesus already knows your intentions. And indeed, God knows the longings and desires of our hearts more than we ourselves do. God already understood why he was asking. There was something relating to neighbors that this man was not doing. And perhaps because he wasn't doing it with his neighbors, he wasn't truly loving God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what Jesus was trying to get him to understand. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand. You can't be a half Christian. It's either you follow the word of God or you're not following the word of God. It's like when he said, if you break one of the least of these commandments, you've broken them all. Because if you had to sum up the, the commandments, it's simply one word. Love. God is love. Therefore, his commandments are simply words that human beings can understand in the way we interact with one another as to what love looks like when we behave in certain ways with each other. He's merely broke it down. But in essence, it's one big thing, love. So if you do this, but I don't do that, don't come asking Jesus, what must you do to be saved? It's all of it or nothing. And so Christianity is all or nothing. We spend a lot of time, a lot of time tricking ourselves, believing that because I do 99 things, that, that qualifies me and God owes me heaven. Because God, look what I've done and what I've been doing. The truth is, it's the 100th one that you have disobeyed, that's sin. And last I heard, the wages of sin is death. That's why I'm encouraging us, don't come all this way only to withhold the, the, the 100th one. It's useless. Grab that 100th one and obey that too. You understand what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? There's nothing new under the sun. This man tried it. Others have tried it. And in every case, Jesus is saying, no, surrender it all. Surrender it all or be lost. That's the bottom line. All right. So we got to move on. Well, let, let me let me let me uh, read this first. It says God has given us his word in it. Because remember, Jesus is the word in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. And that same word became flesh. This is the same word that he has put into human language for us to interact with. We sit with Jesus every time we open the Word, brothers and sisters. He is the Word. We say, I wish I could talk to Jesus face to face. I wish I could just walk with Him for a little while. Oh, how blessed those disciples were that they could actually physically walk with Jesus. Jesus saying, listen, brothers and sisters, I've given you my Word. I am the Word. When you sit down to reason with the pages of Scripture, you are sitting down and reasoning with me. Therefore, when you disobey the words in the pages of scripture you disobey me and so we got to do this in it we, we can find all the truth that we need to know about how we are supposed to live about how we are supposed to treat <coughs> others how we're supposed to live and treat others you want to know what that looks like sit with Jesus in the pages of scripture because remember, he told them everything concerning himself, starting with Mo Moses and all the prophets, the things concerning himself. In other words, the Bible is Jesus. 
Ah, I'll stop there. Let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, Brother Craig, to inherit eternal life. Deep question. We're going to get in deeper here. So take us to Luke chapter 10 and verse 28. Luke ch chapter 10 and verse 28. Luke 10 verse 28. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. Do this and thou shalt live. Amen. I don't normally interject at this point, right? <laughs> but I have to say, look at what he said. Do this. Let, keep it in mind when Brother Craig's talking. The scripture said, you answer right. Do this and you shall live. No. Nah. Do it. Do it. And you shall live. There's no substitute Just do for it. living. Just do it. Amen. Go ahead, Brother hey. Craig. <laughs> and um, what I got out of, that, out of this is it's clear that the learned Jew was confounded by Jesus' answer. For the Bible says that a soft answer turns away wrath. For Jesus' answer was now in direct conflict with what the lawyer was thinking and his own hostile way of judgment. For his knowledge of the law showed that he was familiar with the words, but not the word. I'll explain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We become so engaged in making sure that we can relate a message that we miss relating the messenger. The lawyer saw the words as just letters that form eloquent speech and allowed him to feel some sort of authority or privilege. But the word is life. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He missed the fact that Jesus not only spoke the word, that he was the word and his actions were the word manifested. It's been said many times, I would rather see a sermon than hear one. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a walking, talking sermon. What he spoke, he did. There was no separation between the word. There should be or cannot be any separation between the word and the life we live. If we continue in the scriptures of Luke, we read about the good Samaritan. And the part of the parable that really touches me is the innkeeper. For God brought a man to him. And in life, God would always put someone in our path that he desires for us to take care of. For some, that might be a person at work that we've had a hard time with. Or someone on the street. Or even as close as our spouse. God gave him a mission to watch over and take care of the one he brought to him. God has already provided us with the resources to fill this mission. We just, we just miss or deny ourselves the opportunity to use what he has given us. And if we don't learn the lesson, it will be repeated. Jesus says whatever he speaks, or whatever he spends on uh, the one that he brought into the end, that he will come again and repay him for all that he has done. Of all the things we have, if we lost any of them, we could always get them back. We could get everything back but our time and effort. The mission of Christ is that of time and effort. And we cannot confuse our effort with works. They are two different things. Works are superficial things that anyone can do. But effort is the direct statement of our love for doing it. Do this and you will live. Put in the effort and love. It, put in the effort and love it takes for the mission to be done. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The love, the effort to put in. This is the thing. There is a scripture that says, if they receive not the love of the truth, that God would send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Here's the thing. It's the love of the truth because God is truth and God is love. If you don't accept truth, you're not accepting love. If you don't accept love, you're not accepting truth. So good Christian in church, 
who, who, who believes they accept truth but shows no love for their fellow human being or their fellow believer. You haven't accepted truth either because the truth says to love. How can we, we've spent so much time separating these two things as if God is a separate when we go and teach that God is one. God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-eternal. You know, co we, we say all the, and in fact, the lesson brings it out. It says, for most believers, giving the right answers about doctrine and faith is not that difficult. Boy, we find it so easy to give you the right answers. You know, we ask a question and we'll, oh, so sweetly and eloquently give the right biblical answer. But the challenge, the challenge instead comes in doing what they know is right. You understand what I'm saying? It's doing it. When I get on your nerves completely, gentlemen, you know, for whatever reason, hopefully I never do, but if I, when I get on your nerves, huh, and you're justified into just giving Elder Smith a piece of your mind to let me know how wrong I am, it's at that point, how do you do it? Do you do it the way Jesus and love says to do it, or do you do it purely out of your emotion, feeling, and hatred to what, what, what I did or said. See, here's where the rubber meets the road, brothers and sisters. It's not just in saying the right answers. It's in doing. And the scripture has made it clear. He's made it clear to this man. You want eternal life? Do these things. In other words, your faith, your faith, because the just don't get it twisted. Every time we say the word do, some people get that a little twisted up. As if, if I just do, do it all, then that qualifies me to be saved. That's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is, the just shall live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in who? Faith in truth, who is God, who is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Faith in love. God is love. Faith in God. That's what we must live in, faith in God. But if we exercise that faith in God, it's like saying, God, I have to run from here to Somerset. And I believe, I believe that you can take me safely on this run. And I stand here at the start line. Lord, why haven't you taken me to Somerset? <laughs> I believe and I have faith and the person comes to you and you, they say, listen, it's time to start running. Nope, I have faith that God can get me to Somerset. Huh? So that person leaves you behind and starts off running. And that person is not a Christian. Which one of us have more faith? Hmm? Which one? Because the same question is asked about the Samaritan. See, brothers and sisters, the thing is in doing. We had a priest that came by. Oh, I don't, actually, I don't want to jump forward. I don't want to jump forward. But, you know, th this, is, this is some serious business. How many, like, it goes back to this issue of Jesus' method and response, right? Because it ties into this issue of inheriting eternal life. Because Jesus' method pointed us to what we must do to inherit eternal life. This, this issue of eternal life is something that we, we have a part in. He cannot force us to do it. Right? But the thing is, how many of us have thought ourselves to be so great because we're Seventh-day Adventists? And this truth that we have, the spirit of prophecy, all that amazing, awesome, wonderful. Huh? But how many of us have walked around with our chest up and our noses up in the air whenever we get in touch with someone who's not of our faith? And when they begin to talk of Jesus or something like that, our minds shut them down because they can't know. They're not Seventh-day Adventists. They have no, not no truth. Huh? I'll tell you what. I have to tell you all something. The individual, and I learned a valuable lesson about that, about true love. The individual that helped me to become a better Seventh-day Adventist Christian was not a Seventh-day Adventist. In actual fact, this individual was a Muslim, a Muslim brother of mine. Listen, the kind of messages that he's, when we had these conversations, I know when God was speaking to me, and I tell you, I knew that God was using this particular individual to change my life. 
Now he knew I would not become a Muslim, brothers. But the love and respect and, and, and the beauty that we had with one another in sharing scripture and sharing uh, God's word with one another was amazing. And in fact, he said some things that rebuked me, Brother Craig. You know, as a Christian, when do I love? At Christmas time? Hmm? As a Christian, the Jesus we claim we serve never would have treated a Muslim in the way that we treat him. Never. And he understood this concept from Scripture. Yet there were Christ Christians that were treating him badly, not because he was a bad person, but because they felt that they had Jesus and that was it. We're better than you. We have to be very careful about doing that because just by virtue of doing that, we reveal we know not the Jesus of Scripture at all. Huh? We don't know that Jesus. I don't get anybody twisted. I'm not saying that, you know, you should go and believe anything that, that comes. And, no, that's not what I'm saying. But if we don't love these people and reveal it truthfully and not be a respecter of persons, because Jesus told us, do not be respecters of persons. The gospel is for everyone to see, for everyone to hear, to everyone to experience. Everyone. And so if we're going around behaving like we're so great, let me tell you something. There are some people out there who are going to be more Christ-like than you all the while while you're judging them to hell because they're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Wrong. We're wrong, wrong, wrong. If they don't see the love of the truth, then you're going to believe the lie that what you're doing to, 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 to get at those people is God's will. It's not God's will. Huh? I don't want to stay there too long. We've got to move on, but... Brother Garth, take us to Wednesday's, Wednesday's lesson. Loving, oh, here we go. Actually, I, I didn't realize I jumped into it. <laughs> I didn't realize. I'm so passionate about this love. The loving others as we love our very selves. Huh? Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. Take us there. Amen. Micah 6, 6 to 8 says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams mm. or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of, for, of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good mm. and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly yes. and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Ah, mercy. You know, as, as I was um, reviewing this lesson, uh, I, I, I came across this, this quote that I think it, it, it encapsulates the lesson perfectly. It says, in the tapestry of Christian virtues, love is the golden thread that weaves together the fabric of our faith. Now, why does this command to love others as we love ourselves hold such profound significance? Well, let me tell you. It's a reflection of God's nature. Mm. The very essence of God is love. 1 John 4 and verse 8. As children of God, we are called to imitate our heavenly Father. Loving others mirrors the divine nature within us and reflects the character of God or of the God we serve. In Matthew 5 and verse 48, Jesus instructs us, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Our pursuit of perfection is intricately tied to our ability to love others genuinely. When Jesus declared, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. He condensed the entire law and prophets into these two commandments, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Loving others as we love ourselves fulfills the law and encapsulates the essence of God's divine expectations for his people. The love we share within our church and community creates a haven of support, encouragement, and unity. In John 13, verse 35, Jesus states, 
by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you do what love one another our love my friends becomes a powerful testimony to the transformative power of Christ and draws others into the warmth of his embrace mm -hmm. our love for others becomes a radiant testimony to the watching world in a society often marked by division and strife our commitment to love stands my friends as a beacon of hope first peter 2 and verse 12 urges us to live such good lives among the pagans though they accuse you of doing wrong they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day he visits us mm -hmm. god's overarching plan for humanity is rooted in love in galatians 5 and verse 14 paul succinctly captures this truth for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment love your neighbor as yourself loving others as we love ourselves aligns us with god's purpose fostering an environment where his love can be experienced and shared and finally the command to love others as we love ourselves is not merely a suggestion it is a divine imperative friends as we embark on this exploration of love may our hearts be stirred to love sacrificially emulate Christ's example and be vessels through which God's love radiate to a world in need. Amen. Amen. This, I, I love this lesson in particular. I love the lesson of love in particular. You know what I mean? I like this because, <clears throat> Brother Garth, let's think about this for a minute. You know how sometimes people say, you know, think about this. We can't keep the commandments, right? Okay. But it's 10 of them. Just 10. <laughs> Yet on our jobs, we sometimes have policy manuals as big as the Bible with rules that we keep. Yep. Huh? Yet when it comes to God's love, we say, I can't keep those commandments way too hard. But let me tell you something. First of all, if you, think, if you don't want to think about it like that, then don't. I just say just love. <laughs> just love. Now, you don't have to think about 10. No, I'm not going to think about these 10. Uh, let me just think. So if you want to just think about one thing, if 10 is too much for you, then think about one thing. Love. Amen. However, you will find that when you try to understand what love looks like between you and I, and one day you see my house is bigger and my car is better, you know, my children are in high, high level schools or whatever, and you start to feel a little covetousness. A little jealousy raising up in your mind. And then you have to say, neighbor, I love you. And I have to say, how do I know you love me? And it's at that point you can say, because God says, thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. Huh? So now you don't covet what I have, but you pray, Lord, bless them even more. I don't have it. But thank God somebody's got to get a, get a chance to have success. Lord, bless them even more. That's what love looks like. Or if you don't want to think about that, I say just love. But when your neighbor's wife is really fine and she's really pretty and you start to make inroads to do what you ought not to do and you say, neighbor, I love you because I'm a Christian. huh? And our neighbor's going to say, how do I know you love me? Because, brother... I am not going to commit adultery with my neighbor's wife or anybody's wife. You understand? That's how I know you love me. So, brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of Ten Commandments when you can follow laws by the thousands. God has made it easy for you. Simply love, Brother Craig. Yeah. And I, I love how you made that example. And what came to my mind is, is driving a car. You got all these rules when you drive a car. And when you first start driving, you're not really cognizant of how far to stay behind, mm. how long you should stop at a stop sign, how far away you should indicate before you turn. 
But as you continuously drive, as you're continuously on the road, yes. those rules become ingrained in your mind and you just simply do them yeah. because you have been practicing it every day. Yes, Amen. sir. Amen. Huh? See, that's the double right there, Brother Craig. <laughs> Very simple. See, it's, 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 not, it's not rocket science, really. God put his word in human language, specifically so that we could understand it. We can understand it, but spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We have to connect. We have to do something in order for this to happen. We have to connect with the Spirit of God. Connect with God. Let Him open that door. You know, I'm at the door knocking. Open it. Let Him come in. That place that only can be opened by you, He's at that door knocking. If you open it, he'll come in and sup with you, dine with you, help you understand things you never understood before. You'll be doing things, uh, you'll be doing the love part of these commandments without even thinking twice about it. Huh? It may be a little difficult at first, sure, we all go through that. It may be a little, but there are some things you're just going to start doing and realize, hey, well, I didn't realize I, I don't have to think about it anymore. My life is just that way. That's what God is trying to do in us, brothers and sisters. See, we need to understand loving others is a reflection of how much we love God. It's not the opposite way around. We could, the Bible lets us know, says, you know, even the Gentiles love those who love them. <laughs> even sinners do that. What, what big deal is that? Huh? You, you, you give good things to people who you love, that's easy. It's doing those good things for the guy who, who just gave you a curse word at work and you all left work at, at, at two minutes apart and when you get two minutes down the road, there he is with a flat tire, huh? <laughs> needing assistance. Huh? Now show me, now show me what your Christianity is worth. Because huh? he, even he could ride, ride right cross somebody who hated him, who cursed him, ah, but not the Christian. Love. Is the basis and God is trying to get us back to the simplicity of the gospel love desire love look for love live love read love like sing love 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 it's then they know that you are my disciples because you have what for one another huh? not programs with one another you know not you, because you have love for one another that's how they'll know that you are my disciples brothers and sisters it's very simple I know it's, it's simple, but I know doing it, it's a whole another level, huh? Amen. Well, let's move on to Thursday's lesson. Brother Craig, take us to Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 34. The Good Samaritan story. I love this story. The Good Samaritan story today. Go right ahead. It says, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. What, what really stood out, I, I wrestled with this lesson, because it, it was so simple to answer and simply say, do what Jesus done, yes, or do what Jesus would do. Mm -hmm. But is that really the basis of the lesson? Yes, but how do we actually get there? So I, I, I try to go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that we see in the Bible, and as it says, a certain man. We see a certain man every day, even more so here in church. And every time we look in the mirror, we see someone in phys if we see someone in physical distress, it's almost a no-brainer to the fact that call 911 or, or we go to help them. 
And in some places, there's actually a good Samaritan law that if you see someone in distress and don't help them, it's actually a crime. But to go deeper is to be able to recognize the spiritual distress that someone is in. To be able to have a conversation with someone and know that they need immediate help or may, maybe immediate prayer. To be able to give it without regards of what it takes. It's the spiritual life of a man that has been beaten up and is half dying. It's the character of the world that is in ruin and in need of a good Samaritan. If we are honest, we would see ourselves as the one lying on the wayside on the road in dire need of help. And without the ever and without the ever present and daily communion with God, we are but a moment away from being overtaken by evil and even dying ourselves. Christ has come into our lives to save us, and he has brought us to a place of healing, the inn or the church. And he has given the innkeeper the responsibility to watch over us. But we today, are we today like the lawyer, so full of ourselves that we fight against the innkeeper, we mm -hmm. fight against the inn staff, we fight against the other guests that are in the inn? Mm -hmm. The innkeeper has told us that the one who brought us here is coming back for us. But some feeling healed and healthy leave before his return. The Good Samaritan, Jesus Christ, has given us a mission and entrusted us to do a work that he will repay upon his return. Mercy. But do we now see the bill too high to continue? Ooh. Do we feel that the payment can't be made? My question is this. Is the inn closed and the innkeepers going home, or are they still here doing the work? that was asked of them to do. Oh, my, 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 my. Uh, I don't even know what to say <laughs> after that, Brother Craig. I never, ever thought of it that way. Bro, brothers and sisters, I, did you hear that? Huh? The inkey, I listen, listen. The Holy Spirit, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, Brother Craig. It was the Holy Spirit of God that revealed that to you. That is a beautiful thought process about, about thinking. And, and you know, do, when we feel like we're, we're good enough, do we, do we leave instead of waiting for his return? Ah, oh, oh my goodness. Absolutely beautiful point in, in this lesson. The Good Samaritan, brothers and sisters. Here we see again a man who was considered outside of the church, considered by the church as somebody unworthy to even... Uh, 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 interact with huh? and, and, and we know when he used the word Samaritan huh? if you were talking to a Jew huh? the word good and Samaritan did not go together yet this story is about the good Samaritan and what was Jesus trying to show us don't be a respecter of person. Don't you ever assume you know the heart of a human being. You might call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist and know all manner of things, but it doesn't mean that you behave the way uh, you behave in accordance with the word that you know. Because just the fact that you in your very thought belittle someone as beneath you, automatically you have already disqualified yourself. Yet while believing the lie that we're better, that somehow God knows us more and loves us more. No, brothers and sisters, God loves that person just as much as he loves you. And he's given you and I the responsibility to reveal that love, not to push them down further. Even if it's only in your thought, get rid of the thought. Because remember, you are to love the Lord thy God with all thy mind and with all your heart. He's after the very way you think. So when you think wrongly about someone or situation, work with God's spirit to allow him to change you in that thought process. Put it away. Fight it with everything that's in you, with all your strength. Fight it because it's not right. So brothers and sisters, I, 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 I'm just going to leave that there because Brother Craig so eloquently uh, uh, gave us that example of the, the innkeeper and, and what, how to listen. 
if, you, if you're not sure about that, rewind this thing afterwards and go back and listen to that. Because we need to stay in the end. We need to remain in our place. We need to continue to allow them, Him to take care of us until not when we feel we're, we've had enough and we're better and we're all healed. No, until He says that you're all ready. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, Brother Steve, please close us out uh, in this lesson for Friday's lesson. All right. Friday's lesson. Um, Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by, or sanctify them to live in accordance with the truth. And Jesus' word, God's word is truth. So let us consider this poem as we make God's mission our mission towards our neighbors. And this poem is entitled, The Cookie Thief. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shops, brought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man sitting beside her, as bold as he could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag in between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock as the gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I would blacken his eye. <laughs> With each cookie she took, he took one more. When only one was left, she wondered what he could do, what he would do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, she took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when he, sorry, she had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight had, was cold. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving in great. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat. Then she, looked, then she sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her bag, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. Hmm. If mine are here, she moaned in despair, the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. So remember, there is no worse lie than the truth misunderstood by those who hear it. Ah, mercy, what a fitting, fitting poem to close this lesson. Let us go and do likewise. Amen, Brother Garf. Close us out in prayer. Amen. Loving Father, we pause to thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity that we can, we have to explore your words. We give you thanks, Lord, for the fact that you are love and the fact that, Lord, you show us constantly through your words how it is that we ought to love you and love our neighbors. I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work through us to uh, reach out to those, Lord, that we may, be, that we may consider unlovable. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for those who would have uh, tuned in today. We pray that the message that you wanted them to receive, Father, they would have received it. And I pray that you will help all of us, that in our interactions with one another, we will learn to love them just as much as you love us. Be with us even now, Lord, as we go into another phase of worship today. Bless us all, and may we receive the blessing you have in store for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. God bless. God bless you, friends. We are so thankful that you decided to join us today for Lagos University this deep, exhilarating study of the Word of God. We pray that you were blessed by it, and we know that as you study your Sabbath school lesson each week, that you will continue to grow in Jesus Christ. Here at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, 
we have some other avenues that you can contact us uh, to make your experience even more rich. So for instance, we have, if you would, a prayer line uh, that you can tap into. Uh, you can see that on your screen right now uh, where you can actually come and share your prayer request. If by chance uh, you didn't get it in there, feel free to write your request on the chat or uh, you can text our pr actual number here for Lagos University, uh, which is 441-517-5810. Uh, we pray that you are blessed by everything that you get here involved with. And at the same time, feel free uh, to email us any request for Bible studies, whatever you might need, at HamiltonSDA at gmail.com. That's HamiltonSDA at gmail.com. Until next week, uh, as you continue to study your lesson, know that we are avidly preparing for the next encounter we have with you so that God can take us deeper into his word. The word logos is a word that actually means the word. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The Bible also says thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That same Bible says order my steps in your word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. And so as we prepare for next week, we want you to prepare as well. Make the Sabbath school lesson your daily study so that the next time you come into this place, whether it's virtually or in person, you may be able to contribute to this great thing we call Lagos University. God bless you, friends, and have a wonderful Sabbath. Pathfinders, get ready for the biggest international camporee ever. Join 55,000 Pathfinders in an all-new location in Wyoming. In 2024, get ready for bigger campgrounds, more world records, special events, and incredible new activities. Join Pathfinders from all over the world and participate in daily parades, trade pins, earn honors, witness inspiring live evening programs featuring the story of Moses, and most of all, grow closer to Jesus Christ. Don't miss the 2024 International Pathfinder Camporee in Gillette, Wyoming. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Here are the announcements for today and the upcoming week. In our family news, condolences are extended to Pastor David Steed II and family and Velvet Scott and family on the loss of their uncle, Early Keith Steed. Please join us for early morning manna every Sabbath morning at 8 a.m. in the sanctuary. Sabbath school after go class resumes at 4 p.m. in the lower chapel. All are welcome. Prophecy master class with facilitator Pastor David Steed II continues nightly Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday from 5.30 p.m. till 6.30 p.m. at Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Please see the bulletin for further details. The Happy Seniors Club will meet again November the 28th at 11 a.m. On Wednesday the 22nd will be the Community Service Feeding Program at the Youth Center from 4 to 5 p.m. and prayer meeting at 6.30 p.m. in the Sanctuary. All are welcome to join the Mass Choir. Rehearsals are every Thursday and we will sing every fourth Sabbath of each month. Come and make a joyful noise with us. Notice from the Community Service Department. As we approach the holiday season, we are looking to continue helping those in need in our community. 
We want to provide grocery vouchers again this year and are asking members to help by purchasing gift cards from the Marketplace or Lindell's Market. The distribution date would be December 15, 2023. Please see Sister Marva Trott, Community Service Leader, or contact the church office at 292-4276 for further information. Notice from the Greeters Ministry. We are building our Greeters Ministry for 2024 to 2025. We are the foyer ministry, plus we are called to give the welcome for divine worship. We are also seeking persons to give the welcome only. To join this ministry, please contact Sister Angela Bean at 595-9534. And gathering begins today immediately after church for one hour. Let's go out into the community distributing the gift bags, Hope for Humanity, and the community report to our neighbors, asking our neighbors to contribute to helping us help others. You will be blessed. For those who would like to join us, please meet immediately after service at the front of the church. We are asking church ministry leaders to meet us as well so you can take a team to your territory. Remember to wear comfortable shoes. Bermuda Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Children's Ministry Department presents End of Year Celebration on Sunday, December the 10th from 2 to 6 p.m. in the center for ages 5 to 12. Children under 5 must be accompanied by an adult. Free food, fun, crafts, and more. Celebrating Sabbath birthdays today are Kadre Hill, Nakia Matthews, and Santos Garcia. Please wish them all a happy birthday today. Celebrating birthdays this upcoming week are Diane Coddington, Rebecca Kelly, and Nyla Bassett on the 20th. Celebrating on the 22nd is Dana Steed. Celebrating on the 23rd are Jabari Gilks, Larry Thomas, and Jordan Sams. And celebrating on the 24th are Stephen Coddington, Dwayne Simons, and Tina Trott. Please wish them all a happy birthday this upcoming week. Our Lord and Savior sacrificed his life for all of us so that we may be cleansed from our sins and made whole. What more can we do but give thanks for his love and grace? As Psalm chapter 106 verse 1 says, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. This is the end of the announcements. Have a wonderful and blessed Sabbath. When you think about school, it's easy to think of it like a building or a classroom. Desks and chairs, busy hallways, piles of books, and that place where you go just to learn. There's the fear of fitting in, not being cool enough, or even the horrors of crossing the finish line last. But once you get there and discover that the ground on which you stand is not just about education or just about grades, diplomas or competitions your eyes open to a whole new world and that world comes to life here at Bermuda Institute it's about people reaching people making deeper connections through the common thread that runs throughout our veins the love of Christ when we realize that we are all loved and equal in his eyes that love spreads like a wildfire. It's contagious. Within these walls, we learn from the best. Teachers who share a common goal that leads us through paths destined to the highest heights of success. Not just in academia, social, physical, or mental wellness, but also in the spiritual. We pray together, we learn together, 
We grow together. We discover together. There are books. There are classrooms. There are tests. But there's a very important part you can't put on paper. It's truly living. Living as God created us to. It's servanthood. It's making healthy choices and working together to gain something so much bigger than this world has to offer. It's the relationships. It's laughter. It's the chapel service. It's good conversations with good friends. It's expressing who we are. It's hard work, but lots of fun. So we go to Bermuda Institute for the education, but in the end, what we take away is the experience of a lifetime, an experience for eternity. Experience Bermuda Institute.
Happy Sabbath, church. I invite the congregation to stand at this time. As we gather today, let our hearts converge in unity. For this moment is not just a gathering of individuals, but a symphony of souls seeking the divine embrace. In this sacred space of worship, we find a refuge, a sanctuary, where earthly burdens meet heavenly grace. Let us enter this sacred hour of worship with praise and gratitude, recognizing that each heartbeat is a rhythm and the grand anthem of God's love. The psalmist invites us into this divine melody, saying, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. As we prepare to lift our hearts, minds, and voices in worship, let this scripture be the melody that precedes our praise, reminding us that our entrance into God's presence must be paved with gratitude and adorned with praise. The church is now called to worship. Amen. Let's come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let's enter into his courts with praise. Join us as we sing lustily to the Father this morning. we pray. Almighty everlasting Father, again we come into your courts to praise you. 
We do thank you for all your goodness and your mercies towards us. We thank you for the opportunity to come worship you today, to call upon your name, to lift you up, and to magnify your name. I pray for each person who will participate today. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that you will move in and out and within these aisles and help that nobody will leave here who is listening or who is here physically. No one will leave here the same. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn number 333, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. This is a time when we approach the mercy seat of the Lord. I'll pray on behalf of you. And there are those that are here this morning, maybe feel, feeling a bit oppressed. As the song says, come every soul by sin oppressed, there is mercy with the Lord. And if you feel that you are so oppressed this morning, and I guess each one of us have something that we are oppressed about, so if you feel so oppressed and feel so encouraged, 
I just want to come to the altar. As the praise team sing for us the song for prayer, you are free to come. So may the Lord impress on your heart so that you can come. And so come, let us reason together with It's a great privilege that we have this morning to come in your presence, Lord, to give you praise and to give you thanks. Not so much that any of us are worthy, but because of your matchless grace, you have brought us to this place to worship and to praise your name. Lord, I first ask you to remove anything from me that is unlike thee, that as I pray and be off of your people, that my prayer will be heard. And so, loving Lord, what a wonderful privilege it is to say, Abba, Father. And to know that when we look back on ourselves, we can't find anything good that we have done so that we can count ourselves worthy of this privilege. But we give you thanks and we praise your name for your goodness and your mercies. Lord, we first present those that are sick before us. We ask you, Lord, to heal according to your will. Let your will be done in their lives. Oh, Father, and then those that have lost loved ones. Oh, Father, you know them by name. And so, Lord, we present them before you. We present each church families before you because some of them are from different church families. So, Lord, we present those families. And we pre present Hamilton before you who have lost uh, loved ones also, Lord. Uh, so, Lord, we continue to Ask you, Lord, to comfort those that need, that need comforting. Uh, continue, Lord, to give them the assurance that one day soon and very soon they shall see their loved one. It is for us to remain faithful, O oh Lord, so that we can behold our loved ones when you come. Lord, keep us in the hollow of your hands. Make us trophies for your kingdom, we beg you, Lord. Help us that what we study will be reflected in our lives day by day. Continue to bless each one that are here this morning. Remember the visitors among us, Lord. We pray for them. May as they listen, Lord, they will respond, what must I do to be saved? Lord, remember our general membership, Lord. Those are so faithful. They come to church. They are here this morning, and we just give you thanks for them, Lord. And we just ask you to strengthen each one of us, Lord. Help us to look to thee, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Give us grace to carry him. Give us hope in a hopeless world. Help us, Lord, to look away from the things that glitters and keep our eyes heavenward. Lord, we present those that have come to uh, witness the baptism this morning, Lord, of those loved ones. We ask you, Lord, that they too will be touched. Uh, continue to be with those little ones that shall get baptized this morning. Lord, guide and protect them. Keep them in, the right, in their right mind and help them, Lord, to focus on you and you alone. Lord, we also pray for those that will break the bread of life this morning. We ask you, Lord, to hide each one behind the foot of the cross that as they do what they have to do, what you have tell them to do, Lord, it is not about self, but it is about you and you alone. Continue to bless each one of us, Lord, 
There are so many things we have failed of asking thee for, but fail not to grant according to your will we ask. For all of these blessings we ask in no other name but the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just as I am. Happy Sabbath, family. Blessing to each and every one of you. Today is the day that the Lord has made. And with a thankful heart, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And what a privilege it is, a blessing, that all of us are here fellowshipping here together in the presence of God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To our visitors that are visiting us by social media, by radio, and even by ATV, good morning. Good morning. For our visitors that are here in the sanctuary, may I please invite you to stand. Tell us your name and where it is that you are visiting from. We'd love for you to stand. We'd love to greet you. Amen, amen. Please. Good morning, Lori Smith, your guest of wonderful blessings. Hello, Carol Ann. Hello, Carol Ann Griffith, one of my past co-workers. Really wonderful to see you here this morning. Down the back, please. Welcome, welcome. You're here for the baptism this morning. Wonderful, wonderful occasion. Anyone else? I do not want to miss anyone. Well, it is with love and respect for our dear pastor, David Steed II, and with using his very own words, it is our prayer today that the peace of God and the presence of God will make a guerrilla encouragement in your heart that you might be persuaded and find the passionate love and the precious promises and the perpetuous heart of the man we call Jesus Christ, our Lord. Welcome, everyone. Blessings and happy Sabbath. Pastor Steve. Amen. Can the church say amen? Happy Sabbath to all of you. We welcome you here to the Thanksgiving service of the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have a few remarks, but I'm going to defer them uh, because we have a lot to accomplish today. I want to ask, uh, if you would, if our secretary for the nominating committee, she's going to come at this time, Sister Latrika Showers. Can we say amen for the hard work of the nominating committee? Can the church say amen? I want to thank them for their hard work, but we want to go ahead and jump right into that report at this time. I'm going to ask her to read that for us. Morning. Sorry. 
let me just say, uh, any position that is not stated or not filled has been deferred or referred to the uh, incoming board. Uh, the incoming board will deal with any vacancies that remain uh, on the uh, list of officers. I think it's just a few, uh, but they will be deferred to that. Um, so I'm going to let her read that and then I'll make some comments when she's done. Good morning, church. This is the first reading of the nominating committee report for the 2024-2025 year. Elders. Head elder is Jason Smith. The current serving or the serving elders will be second elder Corvio Hilton, second elder Jamal Oboy, Daphne Wallace, Mark Matthews, Dr. Roland Sams, Kevin Stewart, Eugene Tatum, Lamal Birch, Garth Dixon. Elders in training are Michael Spencer and Dilvion Bramwell. Elders um, emeritus George Birch, Clarence Simons. Wayne Keynes, Reginald Musson, Morris, Ma Morris Francis, Lewis Thomas, Kim Aswood, Onesimus and Zambalinda, Alan Fox, Stephen Hildip, Derek Allboy. Treasury team is led by Elder Onesimus and Zambalinda. Assistant treasurers are Elder Kim Aswood, Elder Kevin Stewart, Calicia Glasgow, Ladrika Showers. The accounting system support is Sandra Smith, Treasury clerks, team one, the leader is Juliette Dillis, and she's assisted by Gloria Brown and Robert Dillis. Team two, leader is Erica Brown, and she's assisted by Diane Cassidy, Derek Main, and Sandra Smith. Finance and budget committee is led by Elder Onesimus and Zabalinda. The youth, the Adventist youth rap is Keisha Brown Dixon and Keisha Wellington. Community service rap is Marva Trott. Facilities management rep is Malachi Aswood. Family life reps are Patrick and Mr. Montero. Health and temperance rep, Dr. Tanea Birch. Sabbath school rep, Venetia, Venetia Sterling. And the floor members are Brian Hildip, Carlita O'Brien, Ladrika Showers, and Rosalind Francis. The deacons, head deacon is Craig Otterbridge. Assistant head de deacons is Dasrick Allen. Stephen Doyman, Neville Green, Kenneth Steed. The Deacon Board is Jeffrey Blair, Tracy Keynes, Travis Keynes, Simber Shay, Shigwande, Troy, sorry, Simberash, I do apologize. <laughs> Shigwande, Troy Dean, Gladwin Goins, Dalwin Joseph, Derek Ming, Malachi Otango, Vernon Tankard, Charles Trott, Carlton Williams, and our junior deacon is Joshua Matthews. Deaconesses, head deaconess is Karen Henry, assistant head deaconess are Pamela Birch, Sonia Hilda, and Wanda Spence. The deaconess board consists of Elicia Oboy, Chanel Bean, Keisha Brown Dixon, Dr. Shannon Lee Birch, Dr. Tanea Birch, Tanea Bethello, Max, sorry, Tammy <laughs> Bethello, Maxian Keynes, Taboka Shigwande, Betty Doylan, Lucinda Green, Olivia Mayato, Ludrika Shalist, Olga Smith, Deaconess Emeritus, Shernat Keynes, Ethel Dickinson, Manola Douglas, Shirley Henry, Ruth Hildip, Joy Joel, Barbara Matthew, Marie Ming, Betty Simons Bean. The junior deaconesses are Myla Birch, Samira Lee Birch, Elena Fox, Alexia Henry, Nakia Matthews, and Leila Spencer. Church clerks is led by Annette Eve. Assistant head is Ardeen Williams. The clerks are Taboka Shigwande, Andrea D'Souza, Kiva Evans, Karen Henry, Charmaine Spencer, and the junior clerks are Alexia Henry and Leila Spencer. Audio technicians, that's led by Lorenzo Birch, and he's assisted by Jamie Sedanio, Dr. Alan Fox, Dylan Fox, Al Anthony Fox, Alda Morris Francis, Carmita Hendrickson, Kevin Mallory, Malik Showers, Amaya Smith, Jane Smith, and Michael Spencer. Events of youth have co-heads, Keisha LeBron Dixon, 
sorry, Keisha Brown Dixon and Keisha Lo Wellington. AY leader, devotional secretary is Marie Ann Brown. Assistant devotional secretary, Joshua Matthews. AY leader secretary is Adnal McCallum. Assistant secretary, Samara Lee Birch. AY leader treasurer is George McCallum. Assistant treasurer, Daquan Dixon. AY leader personal um, PR and communications is Jalen Smith. And his assistant is Jacoby Oboy. AY leader special events and social activities is Can Candilla Wilson Altenor. AY leader hospitality and catering, Keisha Lo Wellington. AY leader Pathfinder and Adventurer Liaison Officer, Carrie Ann Stewart. Children's Ministry Head, Velvet Scott. Assistant Head, Donette Simons. And the members are Asher Altenor, Erica Brown, Anna K. Burke, Shernat Keynes, Andre Hollinsid, Lachey Hollinsid, Corey Hyde, Corville Hilton, Karen Main, Nastasia Mori, Lesleen Smith, Charmaine Spencer, and Skylar Williams. Communications, the head is Sim Roche Chigwande. Members are Dilvion Bremwell, Andrea Breen, sorry, Andrea Brown, Taboka Chigwande, Al Anthony Fox, Wayne Hodgson, Calvin McNaughton, and Malachi Otango. Community service, the head is Marva Trott. Members are Marlisa Alexander, Jacoby Oboy, Sarai Birch, Samira Lee Birch, Gerald Burgess, Diane Coddington, Patricia Darrell, Linda Green, Carmita Hendrickson, Kevin Hendrickson, Janet King, Derek Ming, David Morey, Cheryl Moore, Eugene Richardson, Sandra Smith, Elder Clarence Simons, Elder Eugene Tatum, Elder Daffith Wallace, and Robert Wolf. Facilities Management, the head is Malachi Aswood, Maintenance Supervisor is Derek Ming, Deacon Rapp is Karen, sorry, is Craig Outerbridge, Deacon Nash Rapp, Karen Henry, Elder Rapp is Elder Jason Smith, Treasury Rapp is Elder Onesimus and Zabalinda, and the members are Elder Kim Aswood, Lorenzo Birch, Diane Coddington, Troy Dean, Elder Morris Francis, Kevin Hendrickson, Jane Smith, and Robert Wolf. Family life. The co-heads are Patrick and Ms. Dear Montero. <coughs> the members are Sharnat Keynes, Karen Ming, Nastasia Mori, David Rogers, and Danette Simons. Health and Temperance head is Dr. Tanea Birch, Assistant Heads, Dr. Ashley Blair, and Kishala Wellington. The members are Melissa Alexander, Althea Box, Marianne Brown, Christine Keynes, Betty Doylin, Annette Eve, Alda Allen Fox, Adnal McCallum, David Morey, Dr. Celia and Zambalinda, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, and Jane Smith. <coughs> Home and school slash education, the head is Andrea Brown. The members are Althea Box, Nastasia Mari, Dr. Carmen Rabain, and Judy Teard. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Interest coordinator is Lewis Simons. Music ministry, the head is Michael Spencer. Assistant head, Christina Dickinson. Praise team leaders, week one, Patrick Montero. Week two, Tracy Richardson. Week three, Michelle Spencer. Week four, Michael Spencer. The music musicians are Alda Corville Hilton, Terry Henry, and Simone Alderbridge. Multimedia. Uh, multimedia, the head is Alda Kim Aswood. The assistants are Jacoby Oboy, Elder Lamal Birch, Annette Eve, and Jalen Smith. Members, <coughs> mem thank you. The members are Lorenzo Birch as audio head, Dilvion Bremwell, Samara Lee Birch, Michael Keynes, Olivia Keynes, Travis Keynes Jr., Daquan Dixon, Dominique Dixon, Gar Elder Garth Dixon, Steve Doylin, Pedro Durant, Elena Fox, Alexia Henry, 
Sonia Hilda, Carmita Hendrickson, Kipton Hollinsid, Nicholas Jarrett, Kevin Mallory, Joshua Matthews, Nakia Matthews, Azaria Richardson, Josiah Richardson, Shawnarika Sams, Danette Simons, Layla Spencer, Eddie Tucker, Sean Tuzo, Robert Wolf, and honorary member, Gina Coddington. Pathfinders. Director is April Tuzo. Counselors are Jacoby Allboy, Lakeisha Bean, Naraya Bean, Althea Box, Lorenzo Birch, Gavin Burke, Christina Dickinson, Kim Fox, Malachi Otango, Kamaya Rose, Leslie Smith, Carrie Ann Stewart, Candilla Wilson Altenor. The drill master is Elder Kevin Stewart, and our junior counselors are Myla Birch, Elena Fox, and Lene Lowe. The adventurer director is Katiska Guerrero, and the counselors are Elder Corville Hilton and Bria Watkins. Prayer ministry, the head is Elder Eugene Tatum. <coughs> no, I'm good. Religious liberty, the head is Elder Corville Hilton, and the members are Dilvian Bremlau, Steve Doylan, Carmita Hendrickson, and Craig Otterbridge. Sabbath school, head Sabbath school superintendent is Venetia Sterling, Assistant Superintendent Logos, Chanel Bean, Lower Division Head, Velvet Scott. Stewardship, the head is Elder Mark Matthews. Young Adult, the head is Carrie Ann Stewart. And Couples Ministry, the co-heads are Dennis and Carlita O'Brien. Gourmet Committee, the head is Diane Coddington. Assistant Head, Marva Trott. Members are Kim Burgess, Danica Coddington, Monica Kelly, James Kelly, Kareen McNorton, Sharon Moore, Shonarika Sams, out of Clarence Simons, out of Daffith Wallace, and Robert Wolf. Greeters, the head is Angela Bean. Lay Bible workers, head is Janet Smith. Men's ministry, the head is Elder Alan Fox. Members are Lorenzo Birch, Jamie Sedenio, James Kelly, Derek Ming, Craig Otterbridge, Eugene Richardson, Michael Spencer, and Elder Kevin Stewart. Seniors Ministry, the head is Rochelle Ming. The members are Sydney Bean, Tammy Pothello, Diane Cassidy, Patricia Darrell, Al Anthony Fox, Calicia Glasgow, Carmita Hendrickson, Kevin Hendrickson, Alcina Russell, Deanna Small, Vernon Tankard, and Ardine Williams. Singles Ministry, the head is Quinnincia Williams. Social Committee, the head is Jermaine Richardson. Members are Danica Coddington, Deshante Coddington, Kevin Mallory, Josiah Richardson, and Tracy Richardson. Ushers, the head is Patricia Darrell. Members are Erica Brown, Sarai Birch, Leilani Peters, Adriana Showers, Jasmine Showers, Marva Trott, and Thelma Wong. Women's Ministry, the head is Chanel Bean. Members are Melissa Alexander, Kiva Evans, Melanie McDermott, Wanda Spence, and Laura Trot. Tucker, sorry, Laura Tucker. And worship coordinator, the head is Ladrika Showers, assistant head, Lorene Holder, and the members are Alicia Oldboy, Chanel Bean, Dr. Ten Dr. Tanea Birch, Calicia Glasgow, and Sonia Holder. And this is the board members for the 2024-2025 year. Um, head out. The board members are Jason Smith, Corville Hilton, Jamal Oboy, Daffith Wallace, Mark Matthews, Kevin Stewart, Eugene Tatum, Dr. Roland Sams, Lamal Barch, Garth Dixon, Anisimus and Zambalinda, Craig Otterbridge, Karen Henry, Annette Eve, Lorenzo Barch, Keisha Brown Dixon, Kishalo Wellington, Velvet Scott, Simba Rash Shigwande, sorry, Simba Shea Shigwande, Marva Trot, <coughs> Malachi Aswood, Patrick Montero, Mister Montero, Dr. Tanea Birch, Andrea D'Souza, Elois Simons, Michael Spencer, April Tuzo, um, Kim Aswood, Eugene Tatum, Corville Hilton, Venetia Starlin, Mark Matthews, and Carrie Ann Stewart. And this concludes the first reading of the nominating committee report. Can the church say amen?
Can we say amen for Ladrika? Reading that with just one sip of water. Can the church say amen? We praise God for her hard work and the hard work of that committee that's been coming here every Sunday, probably for the last couple of months. Uh, we thank them for their hard work. Sure, so I appreciate that. Um, we uh, will have, uh, being that that has been raised, we will have uh, a time to come uh, that has already been established. Uh, that is Tuesday, uh, Tuesday at, I believe, I don't want to make a mistake here with the committee. We chose Tuesday, I want to say it's either 5.30 or 6. 5.30 is the correct time. So 5.30 on Tuesday for anyone. We already have one. Uh, but if you have any concerns or questions or comments or opinions uh, that you would like to share with uh, the committee, please see me. Uh, please come and see me. Uh, or just send me a note or a text before noon, before noon on Monday, before 12 noon on Monday. Uh, we need to hear from you. I will speak to Sister Jokes afterwards. Uh, but we need to hear from you by 12 on Monday. And we will place you on the list uh, for it to be addressed uh, at the Tuesday evening meeting, uh, which will begin here at 5.30. I see Sister Trot. I saw her earlier. I don't know where she went. But yes, so yes, and you and Sister Coddington, uh, it looks like we will need to have that on uh, Tuesday evening at 5.30. We will need your help. All right. Thank you so very much. I want to thank you for that report, and we will uh, move forward accordingly uh, in our service. Uh, before we get into fellowship, I just wish to recognize, I've just kind of let my announcements go to the side because I need to uh, keep this service moving uh, so that um, we can get to our preachers. Is that all right, church? Uh, and so I just want to recognize that we do have some Sabbath birthdays and anniversaries. I want to say happy birthday to Kudre Hill. Can the church say amen? <laughs> Nakia Matthews is celebrating a birthday today. I want to wish her a happy birthday and Santos Garcia. Santos Garcia. We also have the penultimate treasurer of this church and his wife uh, that are celebrating their anniversary today. I'm looking. I'm not sure if they're here, but we want to wish. Yes. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, served this church for over 40 years. Over 40 years as its treasurer. Uh, we never want to forget the sacrifice that he has made. At this time, we want to ask uh, Elder and Sister George Birch. I, you're not downstairs, but you can stand. That's all right. If you can stand up and just wave. It's good to see the elder in the building. Can the church say amen? Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. God bless you guys. How many? 5-0 today? Did you say 5-0 today? 50 years today. Come on, put your hands together for them, church. Put your hands together. 50 years, Lord help us, 50 years of marriage, 50 years of marriage, and I think, come on, you can do better than that, put your hands together for them, put your hands together for 50 years of marriage, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe 44 of those years, at least, was served as treasurer of this church. Come on, church. You can say amen again. I want to thank Elder Birch for his faithfulness. We stand on your shoulders. This building stands uh, because of your financial guidance. And so we thank you for everything you have done for this community of faith. Hey, listen, uh, before I move on, there was one more piece. Yes, I cannot forget. Today is a baptism. I just need everybody to stand up. Now, right after you stand up, right, first of all, just stay in your seat. Repeat after me. There's no place huh? like this place. Huh? anywhere near this place. So this must be the place. This time, stay seated. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I'm so glad I'm in church to witness this baptism. Now listen, now I need you to stand because here's the thing. 
After you stand, we're going to welcome them in, and then I need you to shake each other's hands real quickly because we need to push this service along, okay? Just shake each other's hands real quickly, and we're going to keep moving ahead with this service. But let us stand together and put your hands together and welcome the two newest members of the Hamilton SDA Church, Sister Kalani Smith and Brother Caden Tuzo. Come on, let's sing together. Oh, when the saints, let's sing that song as they come on in. Come on down, you guys. Amen. 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 Can the church say amen? Come on, go ahead and be seated for me if you would. Uh, at this time, we want to invite clerk, uh, one of our clerks to come forward. Uh, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Yeah, let's, just, let's, let's, let's bring a clerk forward. Let's bring a clerk forward uh, at this time and let's uh, get started here. Let's get started here. invite the family of Gabrielle Armani Williams to the front. They will be dedicating their little one to the Lord. Family and friends, supporters, well-wishers, and prayer warriors, please come and surround this family. At this time, as we always do in our services, when I ask the two deaconesses if they'll come close, I need one right here and one right here. We understand uh, uh, that whenever a child is born, uh, that indeed uh, God assigns some guardian angels to watch over uh, that little one. Uh, we are thankful today uh, that Shanae and Dr. Nevin Williams have decided to give back to the Lord what God gave to them. <laughs> Uh, it's a blessed time. Uh, I am excited uh, because of the baby's name. Uh, the baby is named Gabriel. You know, they were considering some different names. Uh, David was at the top of their list, and they, they decided to go with Gabriel. And we appreciate that. Gabriel Amari uh, Williams. Gabriel's an amazing name because uh, there are, if you were, were two covering cherubs in heaven. Uh, Lucifer got kicked out, but he was replaced with a man called Gabriel. And we are thankful for uh, the wonderful Williams family that are here, and I'm sure many that are watching. We wish them all God's love and his speed. The Bible says 
the Bible says to us very clearly. Uh, we look at the story of Job. We find, uh, Job chapter 1, verse 5, that Job lifted up his family and he prayed for them, especially his children, every single morning and even offered sacrifices just in case they might sin. Not that they would. Not that it was guaranteed that they would do something crazy. But just in case they messed up, he wanted his children to be covered. It's an amazing story because Job's story ends, uh, if you would, after he shakes off his three crazy friends and their bad advice. The Bible says Job prayed. And when Job prayed, everything turned in the other direction. As a matter of fact, the Bible says God gave him back twice of everything that he had. The amazing thing is that when you count the sheep and you count the camels and you count everything, it's absolutely double. But when it came to his seven sons and his three daughters that had perished, God only gave him seven more sons and three daughters. And by promising him double, Dr. Williams, here's what he did. He guaranteed in that moment to Job that the prayer he prayed way back in Job chapter 1 verse 5 was answered. For when Job gets to heaven, he will have 14 sons and six daughters in heaven because he just couldn't stop praying for his children. And I want to challenge you guys today to lift up Gabriel in prayer. The devil has a lot of temptations and a lot of things to throw his way. Things we could not imagine when we were kids, Nevin. He's coming with it. Inundating them through media and through their phones and everything else. It's amazing. It's amazing. We were happy to walk at one. They're all over iPads and phones long before they can even walk. <laughs> but it's important to realize that nothing, nothing that you can do in your home is a substitute for lifting your family and lifting Gabriel up in prayer every day. <laughs> I challenge you every day, man, to have worship with your family, uh, to lift him up, to help him to become so familiar with Jesus that he never wants to be without him. Bring him to church. Make sure he's here, as you've been doing. Make sure he continues to come to Crater Row. Make sure he continues to show up. We're the only other home he knows outside of yours is in this place we call Hamilton. May he learn how much God loves him. May he understand a mother's love. Where no matter how much nonsense he does, she welcomes him back uh, into her bosom. Uh, even when dad wants to take him out, uh, mom will be there to let him know that God gave us this child. <laughs> and God wants what's best for him. I pray for this family, and I pray that God continues to bless you tremendously. Uh, it doesn't look like you're done. Maybe three or four more are on the way. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but, but we praise God. We praise God from on high for how he's blessed you, how he's blessed your work, how he has blessed your family. At this time, we want to offer up this precious one in prayer. I'm going to ask you, Deaconess, you come and hold. I don't have the lapel. But you can come. Let's see what Gabriel's got. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let us pray. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I lift up this precious boy. And I place him in your arms. For in your arms there is safety, there is assurance, and there is salvation. God, I lift him up along with his family. And I ask that they would do and work with you every day and night to lead him in paths of righteousness for your name's sake and your name's sake alone. And Lord, indeed, as we lift him up here today, I pray. And when the roll is called up yonder, that Gabriel will be in that number when the saints go marching in. 
Bless him, Father. Make him a productive member of society, but more so a citizen of heaven. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let the saints of the living God say, Amen. Amen. I, need, I know you're looking at me, but I need you to look at the crowd, all right? I present before you, church, Gabriel Amari Williams. Can you guys say hi to Gabriel? Say hi, Gabriel. Hi. You know how to wave yet? You know how to wave? No wave. Okay, all right, all right. No, no, no problem. You want to look at him a little bit more? No? Okay, no problem. All right. all right, so at this time, we want to invite one of our deacons. If they will come forward with the offering plate. change <laughs> all right this is always uh, an amazing test of, of, of whether or not the young fella has been taught to be a cheerful giver uh, so at this time we're going to ask Gabriel if he would give his first offering here uh, in this community of faith all right all right, the spirit is willing, uh, but the flesh is weak. Uh, okay, he, he, he don't want to let it go. It's, he's snatching it. I don't know, very concerned about the future when it comes to tithes and offerings in this place. Amen. He looks like he's ready to knock the deacon out. It's all right. God bless you. Young. He's going to learn. He's going to learn to be a cheerful giver. I believe we have a representative here from the lower division. Yes, come on up at this time uh, because we want to make sure Gabriel's name continues to be listed, if you would, downstairs. Come on, come and hold this baby. We want to symbolically present him to you. If you can hold him, see if Gabriel likes you. He probably already knows you from downstairs. Amen. 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 And as his name is kept on the roll downstairs, we just pray that his name will also be on the roll uh, if you would, when the saints go marching in. Can the church say amen for this beautiful family? We praise God. God bless you, Dr. Williams, and your family. God bless all of you. We love you, and we love you, Gabriel. We love you, Gabriel. God bless you guys, man. You can go back to your seats uh, at this time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me give you your gifts. I'm so sorry. You have gifts. You can stay. Stay where you are just for a second. Let's give you your gifts at this time. There's gifts, a gift bag prepared just for you. Brother and Sister Williams, it gives me great honor to present to you this gift bag from our church, laden with resources and tools so that you can raise strong, healthy, and spiritual children. Be blessed. Hold on, Daddy, Daddy made it into the building. Come on, Daddy, come on up here. Come on, come on. Right. Come on, can we put our hands together for the Williams family again? Come on. Come on, put your hands together. Praise God for them. I'm sorry, there's one more. There's one more. Let me get one more picture. One more picture. One more picture.
as they're making their way back to the seats. Stand to your feet if you would, church. Stand to your feet. We're going to sing one verse because some of you just really want to shake somebody's hand and give somebody a hug. So at this time, we're going to sing a verse or so of Welcome to Hamilton SDA. Come on, let's sing that song together. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them you love them today as we worship God in spirit and in truth. Happy Sabbath. On this uh, month of Thanksgiving, uh, we want to take a time to just thank God by lifting up our voice. And uh, I see a lot of singers sitting, so I would like for you guys to sing with us. We're doing a well-known song. We sing the praises to our King. So when it comes to your turn, the sopranos, I want the sopranos to sing, the altos, and the tenors, okay? We sing the praises to our king. Just clap. We sing. We sing the praises to our king. For he, everybody. We sing the praises to our king. One more time. We sing the praises. We sing the praises to our King. For He is the King of kings. We sing the praises to our King. We sing glory. Give Him glory. For He is the King of kings. We give Him glory. For He is the King of kings. Give Him glory. For He is the King of kings. We give Him glory. 
the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. We sing the praise. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. Three parts, give Him glory. Give Him glory, for He is the King of Kings. Give Him glory. Good morning, church. Um, while reading the nominating committee report, I erroneously left off two names. So I want to add um, Toboka Shigwande as a treasury clerk for team one for the treasury team. And also I missed in the Pathfinder counselors, Pedro Durant. My apologies.
Let's give a hearty amen again to our precious melodies. Sister Jokes, this is a good segue to in gathering. Yes, hearts are gonna be blessed. What did you say? Yes. Um, my responsibility now is to um, take three testimonies from three individuals, uh, giving thanksgiving for what the Lord has done for you on this Thanksgiving Sabbath. So I'm asking that we have three individuals who are willing to give a testimony, a nice short testimony. No, no sermon at all, sermon. A, a short testimony. Can you three stand at this time? Just three. Okay. Any on this side? On this side? Okay, just sit at the back, at the back there.
Um, I just want to thank Lord for his briefing that he turned towards me. Um, okay. Um, um, I don't know if I'll, a lot of you know that I've been having health issues, but God has been so good to me because through all the health issues I'm in heaven, he always seems to put me back on my feet when I feel, when I get down. Um, no one knows what I dealt with when I first found out, um, when I took sick. I went through a lot of changes and I didn't know how to deal with it. I knew I had to turn to God for help. I prayed and asked God to help me deal with it. And, but I was going through so much changes. Um, I, I, I came to a point where I felt like I, I have sisters that I'm very close with. I have a wonderful husband that um, Amen. Amen. I can talk to and have one, I have wonderful children. I couldn't even go to bed at that time. Amen. But I got up one morning and I ran in my husband's study and I got on my knees and I prayed and I said, God, Lord, help me. I don't know how to deal with this. Mm. You're the only one that's going to be able to keep yes. me strong and, and help me deal with this situation. Yes. And I'm going to tell you, since I, I was at my last, you know, um, I was, it was so hard for me because I felt like a failure. I said, um, God, um, I try to be a good person. I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect. You know, I try to be a loving wife and a good mother, good sister and aunt. But it was such a devastating thing for me dealing with these health issues. I'm still going through them, but i am got God to turn to for strength because Amen. Amen. I tell you, he's the only one that got me through it. Because yes. when after I got off my knees that morning, the peace that came over me, I can't explain it. Amen. I've been in hospital a few times with close calls, and I tell you, God is the only one yes. that got me through it. Yes. And sometimes I realize that in life, we might have to go through some stuff in life, but we have God to turn to. We can look at everyone around us, and sometimes God would put us in a position where he's the only one yes. that we can rely on to get us through those situations. Because yes. he's been really, really good to me. I'm, I'm serious. Um, you know, I, sometimes I, I feel so good. I have so much energy. And I get there and I'm going, 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 doing this and doing that. But I say, Gina, come on, you got to slow down. You know, because then the next day I'm, <laughs> I, I, I get up and I, I, and I, I I'm, I feel so tired, and I say, Gina, you know, you just take your time. You know, yeah. you don't have to overdo yourself. But when, but I'm going to tell you what really helped me through the situation, it's helped me through the situation is when I get into God's word. Mm, amen. When I go and get into his word, when I put on my television, I listen to scriptures and gospel music, and it just upsets me, and I just pray to God, and he just gives me that strength to go get through life. Amen. And I just, I can't thank him enough. I can't thank him enough to, for all the prayers I am had from all you wonderful saints and, and um, the doctors, the doctors are wonderful. I tell you, um, going to the hospital here in Bermuda, I never had no issues. Everyone was so wonderful to me. When I went overseas to John Hopkins, I had the best of care from them. They were so supportive and loving to me. And I just thank God. I can't thank him enough. It's just been wonderful. Amen. And I just want you all to know that I love you all. And may we all continue to look up to Christ for strength. Amen. Because he will get us through any situation. Any situation get us through. Yes. And please continue to pray for me through my health issues. And I'll pray for you all too. Amen. Love you all. Okay. Yeah. I want to thank you, uh, sister, for sharing that testimony. I'm going to ask... If members of our Bible uh, worker team can just meet with her in the usher's room, just have a, a word of prayer with her in, in the usher's room, please. Members of the um, Bible team, if you can go and help prayer.
with our sister in the officer's room. Thank you. Brother Neville. Yes, um, my, my, my testament is very, very small. Um, I was fishing the other night, you know, I, you know I knew City Smiley here face, Brother Sons, but I was there by myself. You see where? Okay, yeah. And I, I actually, you know, slipped on the rocks. Mm. All alone by myself. I wouldn't be able to get to my phone. I wouldn't be able to get to anything. And, and it was a hard fall on jagged rocks. Mm. All I got was a little spa, scar on my arm. But before I even got off the ground, while I'm laying there, I just said, thank you, God. You know, I thank the Lord while I'm just still laying there on the ground before I moved, hurting, you know, little, little, little blood coming from me. But thank you, Lord, Amen. because I could have busted my head. Yeah. I could have right. fell over, hit my head and fell overboard. Right. It could have been all manner of things, yeah. you know. So just to say how the Lord keeps us and protects us yeah. in all things. Had a marvelous catch. Amen. Uh, he, you know, he's got a good Amen. catch of fish. But, you know, I have to be thankful. Amen. Thankful Your for those simple yes. things. All right. All right. Amen. Thank you, now. And our last um, question will be Sister Angela Bean will be our last presenter for a testimony. Sister Angela. Well, thank you, Elder. I did not have my hand up. Oh, I was just acknowledging, oh, but okay. I do have oh, a word. Okay, all right. I you do have you a word. Young man? You can use the young man. You can use the young man. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Appreciate that. <laughs> um. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um. So it's, I just want to say that um, one time when I was, so there was this we were a balcony on our house and mm -hmm. I was looking over to see the dog that we had to see if she was okay. Uh, Cause I heard her crying and I was looking over and seeing if she was okay. And then that's when I lost grip and I fell off the balcony mm -hmm. and then I landed on my, um, buttocks and yeah. I looked beside me and I saw a sharp piece of metal mm -hmm. that was there and I was like very surprised and then I, turn, um, I realized that God saved me and protected yes. me Amen. and Amen. that I will die today and that I, I could have fell on that and hurt myself. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Keep that testimony in your heart. I want to thank you for your testimony this morning. Okay. We'd like to invite our little ones to come down. And are we doing the offering for the children? Grab their baskets as we sing. God is good. God is good. God is good. Yes, he is. God is good.
afternoon, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence of singing. Knowing that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord, he is good and his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endure to all generations. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Morning. How are you all today? Hi. Do you know what? We're going to talk about the Good Samaritan today. But before we talk about the Good Samaritan, oh my gracious, oh my gracious, oh my gracious, oh my gracious. Oh, thank you. Oh, these are Jesus' little helpers. Oh, thank you. You know how it feels for somebody to help you? It is a wonderful feel. Thank you. Thank you very much for helping me. Oh, my gracious. Do you know how it feels when you are in need and nobody's there to help you? Do you know what it feels like when somebody calling out for help and it's no help? Do you know when mommy is home and it's all this work in the house, everything is all over the place and nobody there to help? Who like to help mommy? Me. Very good, very good. Take up your socks. Take up all the stuff that you put on the floor. Oh, mommy is overjoyed when you do that. Well, you know what? It was a man going for a walk. And he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he was marching along, and he looked, oh, the road was long and rugged. And when he looked, he looked, and oh, it was beautiful. But guess what? He, somebody came upon him. There was some guys came upon him and shake his hand, and they looked at him and said, how are you? And he was so happy to see them. But they were up to no good. They start filling up what he had. They put some punches in him. Oh, they knock him down. Oh, my gracious father. They give him a hard time and leave him for dead. They leave him for dead and walk away. Oh, my gracious, they walk away. And he was there. He started calling out, help. He was calling out for help. And guess what? There were some people. People came on the road, and they passed by. They walked by. And the, the elder, it was, guess what? It was a pastor. And he passed by. He just passed by on the other side. Oh, my gracious. Then, guess what? Another person came and looked at him and looked at him and run by the other side. Oh, my gracious. He was still calling out for help. And guess what? Another person came by and he heard the cry calling out for help, help, help. And he stopped and find out what was wrong. How can I help you? He noticed that he was beaten up. He was robbed. His head was hurting him. And he decided to help the poor man. He took him to an inn, and he paid for him to stay overnight and if they needed any more money he would have come back and paid boys and girls you know what 
Sometimes in life, you're going to meet up on people who need your help. They're going to be calling out. They're going to be needing, mommy might need your help. This old man might need a blanket to cover him up because they were cold. Do you know there are people who live in the street? They live on the street because they don't have anywhere to live. And sometimes you might have some food that you want to share. And even you could go home and ask mommy, can I have some food to help this gentleman or this lady? You know, sometimes boys and girls, we have to look beyond what we want. You might want a toy. You might want some food. And you're not hungry, but you might want something that you see somebody else have. And you can ask mommy, mommy, can I help that lady that sits on the street? Can I help that young man that don't have, can I get one of daddy's shirt so I can give that old man who needed a new shirt? And mommy might say yes. And you would go out and sometimes you see somebody who are thirsty, the sun is hot. And you say, you have your thermos and what would you do? You would give them some water, yes. You know, God wants us to be a help. God wants us to help. You know, when I think of how God is to us, that Samaritan man, they were telling the, 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 the people that was around there, Samaritans are not good people. But guess who showed that they were neighbor? The Samaritan man. He was passing by, but what did he stop? And he said, come, let me help you. And he take him to the inn, and he paid the money. What? He paid the money, yes. He paid the money for the man to stay until he get back. When he got back, what did you think he said to the person who were running the inn? Thank you. Thank you so much for taking care of my friend. You don't have to know somebody to help them, right? You don't have to know somebody to give them a drink of water. You don't have to know somebody to help them when they are in need. Let us remember today, always be Jesus' little helper. Always do what you can to help somebody else. And Je yes, Jesus loved the little helpers. And today, you're going to ask God to help you to be good helper. We're going to ask, you want to pray and ask Jesus to help us. Let's pray and ask Jesus to help you to be a good helper. Let's go let, ahead. Let us pray. Dear Lord, who art in heaven, thank you, Lord, for being with us this morning, and thank you for bringing us to church. Thank you for food, clothing, and shelter. Oh, Lord, be with all the sins we have done. Even though you, did, you didn't like them, you still loved us. Mm -hmm. You have always given us a second chance, even though we didn't deserve it. Thank you for everything you have done. Be with us today as we worship you. In your name I pray, amen. amen. And don't forget to be Jesus' little helper and help mommy. Thank you. Go back quietly to your seat. Thank you. So give him glory, so give him, glory. Give him honor, so give him for, he is Lord. for he is Lord, and he is Father. Before we're honored by a selection by Brother Daquan Dixon, we'd like to have Elder Clarence Simons just give us the offertory information first. Thank you. We're going to ask our deacons and deaconess to come forward at this time to receive our tithes and orphans, and our orphans is for church budget. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, we ask that you will bless the orphan, the tithes and orphans that are being given today, may be used to help hasten your work in Bermuda and around the world. In the name of Son Jesus, we pray. Amen. scripture reading is taken from Luke 17 verses 11 to 19. Luke 17 
11 to 19, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, right? So maybe it's a little bit different in some of us Bible. So let us begin. It said, now as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers, who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Verse 18, were there, were, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Verse 19, and he said to him, arise, go your way. Your sins had made you well. May God have a blessing to the reading of his word. Hallelujah. We're so grateful to our God. Do we serve a mighty God? Yes, we do. Do we serve a great God? Yes, we do. And today we are going to lift up not just holy hands, but we're just going to render up some praises to God to just show him how thankful we are for all that he has done, all that he has brought us through so far. So great are you, Lord. I'm going to invite Michael to lead us out today. Oh, we 
all the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts, Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. Great are you, Lord. Stay right there. Let's sing it again. All the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. He's great. Great are you, Lord. All the earth, hearts. All the earth will shout your Our hearts. Praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. sing great. Great are you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. God is so good. Oh, and now I'd like to invite a, a guest soloist to come and join our team today and sing another song with us. It speaks about how good God is. It talks about his goodness to us. He wakes us up every morning. He gives us everything that we need. And for that, we just want to honor him with our praise. We just want to continue to give him everything that we have inside of us as we sing goodness of God. Hallelujah. God is good, amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire 
you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god See your is running after me your goodness is running after is running after me with my life laid down i surrender now i give you everything yeah 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 your goodness is running after is running after me say your goodness
Man, my heart's been broken. I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. When I don't know where to go and I don't know where to turn, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Good afternoon, church. Want to thank Michael and the Ministry of Music for the rich musical heritage they've provided us today. Yes. Praise God for that. Would also like to thank my wife for giving her testimony. Yes. She's been meaning to do that for quite a long time. Yes. I love you, sweetheart. Amen. It is a biblical requirement that we give thanks and praise to God no matter the circumstances. Yes. Psalms 100 reminds us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. If someone were to ask you, what is the address of the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church? The correct response would be 43 King Street, Hamilton, Bermuda. What if somebody asks you, what is the address of God? How would you respond? Well, Psalms 22, verse 3 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So, if you want to know where to locate God, it's on a street called praise. Amen? And if you want to visit him, you have to hang out in an environment of praise because that is where God dwells. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Amen. Amen. Today, Elder Matthews, Elder Hilton, and myself will jointly present a sermon entitled, Where Are the Nine? I will be presenting the introductory section Elder Matthews will present the body, and Elder Hilton will present the conclusion of the message. So at this time, we want to invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Please stand, Elders, and let us pray. O kind, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy shown towards us. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross of Calvary, that we may have eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for your resurrection power, power that's available to us as well. well. Father, we invite a double measure of your Holy Spirit to fall upon us at this time. Soften our hearts, Lord, and enlighten our minds so that we can understand your word and apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Where are the nine? Our sermon today is based on the story of the ten lepers in Luke 17, uh, verses 11 to 19. I'm not going to reread the 
verse, uh, I would have, while it's read it for us in the interest of time, I'm going to overlook it. But at the time of this story, Jesus had spent many months in his public ministry, traveling around Israel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and showing forth his compassion and sympathy by perform, performing various healing miracles and casting out demons. So when Jesus entered that certain village, he was well known and recognized by the ten men who were lepers. They had heard about the many healing miracles that, that Jesus had performed, and they were keen to find deliverance from the bondage of their leprosy. Leprosy can be easily transmitted by inhalation or bodily contact, or even contact with the clothing of an infected person. In biblical times, since the potential impact of leprosy was so severe, God laid down prescriptions in the Old Testament to deal with the disease. The priests were essentially given the role of health inspectors. Anyone suspected of having the disease had to go to the priest for an examination. If someone was found to be infected, they were required to wear torn clothes and, and cry out, unclean, unclean, whenever they came near anyone else to warn them of their condition. Lepers were banished from the camp and were required to live in a community with other lepers until they either recovered from the disease or they died. Let me spend a, a moment describing this disease using the research of Dr. Paul Brand and his wife Margaret, who were both medical surgeons who devoted their lives to researching and treating leprosy which is now called Hansen's disease. The Brands were the first physicians to discover that leprosy is not a disease of the tissue, but of the nerves. It is the loss of the sensation of pain that makes sufferers susceptible to injury. They pioneered the idea that the loss of fingers and toes in leprosy was due entirely to infection and was thus preventable. For example, the Brands observed that persons with leprosy would reach directly into a charcoal fire to retrieve a dropped potato, not realizing that they suffered severe burns. Also, patients of theirs in India would work all day gripping a shovel with a protruding nail or, or walk on splintered glass and be totally unaware that they suffered a serious injury and were bleeding profusely. The skin of someone with leprosy loses its original color and becomes thick, glossy, and scaly. As the sickness progresses, the thickened spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to the poor blood supply. Fingers and toes, fingers and toes drop off or are absorbed, and the person emits a very unpleasant odor due to the open sores. So, you may be asking, how is this information about leprosy relevant to us today? 
especially since there are very effective treatments to combat the disease. Well, leprosy is talked about so much in the Bible because it is a graphic illustration of sin's destructive power. It is a powerful object lesson of the debilitating influence of sin in our lives, and it gives us a glimpse in how detestable our sin is to God. In biblical times, those with leprosy were separated from their family, friends, and the community. Sin separates us from God and prevents us from having an intimate relationship with our Savior. Isaiah 58, uh, verse 2, which should be on the screen, says that, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. You know, there are some who believe that God created evil, which is nothing further from the truth. You know, they go on to conclude that God had a role to play in the entrance of sin in this world. Alan White says on page 66 of The Faith I Live By that nothing is more plainly taught in Scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin that there was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace, no deficiency in the divine government that gave occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable, to excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found or cause shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. Sin originated with Lucifer, who rebelled against the government of God. As we discussed, due to damage to the nerves, leprosy destroys the ability to experience physical pain, which is not a good thing. Pain is a mechanism designed by God to alert us to danger and motivate us to avoid it or escape it. In the spiritual realm, God has given us the gift of conscience, which is the voice of God speaking to us through the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 30, verse 21, says, Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left, However, when we yield to sin, we are treading on Satan's territory and our conscience becomes seared as with a hot iron. As a result, our conscience will be unreliable and we are not hear the voice of God. The leper had to constantly cry out, Unclean, unclean. In the spiritual realm, unconfessed sin in our lives 
emits an unpleasant odor to God that cries out spiritually, unclean, unclean. However, if we confess our sins, the Lord has promised that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as I conclude this section of the sermon, let us never lose sight of how detestable our sin is to God. But do not despair. Just like the lepers knew that they could could obtain physical healing from Jesus, we also can call upon Jesus to obtain spiritual healing, regardless of how sinful our life has been to destroy us spiritually. And because of that, we should give Jesus all the thanks and praise and glorify his name. Amen? Amen. We serve a God who is truly worthy. He descended from his throne in heaven to be beaten, ridiculed, and crucified that we may have life and have it more abundantly. He sits on the right hand of the Father, and he looks low as the Lamb who died for the sins of the world. He sits high as King of kings and and Lord of lords, and he looks low as one who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He sits high as the mighty creator of the universe. And he looks low as one who sustains us because in him we live and move and have our being. He sits high as one who was victorious over death and the grave. And he looks low as one whose blood washes away all our sins, whose blood reaches to the highest mountain and the lowest valley whose blood will never lose its power. He sits high as one who has gone to prepare a heavenly mansion for us. And he looks low as one who will come again so that where he is, there we may be also. We need to give him all the praise and all the glory because no eye has seen No ear has heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. How can we not love a God like that? How can we not be faithful in our relationship to a God like that? Let this love motivate us to constantly seek ways to please our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God be with you. Good morning, church. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. Let us turn to Luke chapter 17. I want to read verses 13 and 14. Luke chapter 17, 13 and 14. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. These ten lepers. They were not ignorant of Jesus. They had heard of the wonderful mercy of Jesus. They had heard how Jesus had healed others that were in the same condition as themselves. These ten lepers, the spirit of prophecy says, were made up of Jews and Samaritans. It wasn't just one Samaritan in this group. These ten lepers doomed to death, associated together, 
kumbaya, the prejudiceness that existed between Samaritans and Jews was broken down by the terrible malady of leprosy. And they cried out and they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have you ever cried out to God and said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a wretch. I know I'm nothing. Have mercy on me. And Jesus, he said, go show thyself. Go show yourselves unto the priests. And as they went, they were healed. You see, these priests, they despised these lepers. These, it was nothing worse than being a leper. The only thing worse than being a leper was being a Samaritan that was a leper. You see, Jesus was addressing racism, discrimination, social injustice. He was bridging the gap. And he told them, why would Jesus tell them, go show yourselves to the priests? It reminds me of people that are, that are not in the church anymore. Je Jesus, to me, is saying, go back to church and show them what I've done for you. Go back to church and show them what I've done for you. These priests, they had no love for the lepers. Does anyone know what the opposite of love is? I thought the opposite of love was hate. But the opposite of love is indifference. You see, hate requires an emotion. Hate requires energy. By hating, you hurt yourself. But indifference, that's a lack of concern, lack of sympathy. It's the opposite of love. These 10 lepers, they remind me of people that used to come to church. I asked this question, what happened to so-and-so that used to sit in the fourth row? What happened to sister so-and-so that used to sit in the middle row? No one knows, no one asks the question. No one is concerned. That's indifference. None of us hate anybody in the church, probably. <laughs> but being indifferent, that's something else. You don't care if they live or you don't care if they die. That's indifference. No emotion, no concern. And it's interesting that these lepers, they only came to Jesus because they had an issue. They had heard about Jesus. They had seen all that what Jesus has done, but they never came to him. They only came to him when they had leprosy. Some of us only come to Jesus when we got a problem. But that's okay. I'm okay with that because God says, come. How you come to Jesus is different from how you leave with Jesus. Jesus says, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Come. They only came to Jesus because they had an issue. Beloved, your pain and your suffering is not wasted with Jesus. Your pain and your suffering is designed to bring you to Jesus. If you had not had that pain and that suffering, you you would not have come to Jesus. God says, blessed are you. He says, when you're going through stuff and you're trusting in Jesus, he says, blessed are you. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are you when, you sh when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all oh, manner of evil against you. Falsely, for my name's sake, God says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Rejoice. Your pain and suffering, rejoice, is meant for your good. It's meant for your good. Turn with me to verses 15 and 16. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his knees at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Again, God is addressing the racism. 
the social injustice. It's interesting. I noticed the difference. The 10 lepers, they stood up from afar off and lifted up their voices to, to God, to Jesus, and he answered the prayer. But here in this case, this one leper who had turned back, he fell down on his, on his, on his face at Jesus' feet. He was on the ground. The 10 lepers gave a collective prayer of petition, but there's one leper that turned back. It was worship time. He was on his knees. Application. If you want to give God praise, you need to go on your knees. You need to be on the ground. Turn with me to verses 17 and 18. And Jesus answering said, where there are not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Where are the nine? There are not found that return to give God glory, save this stranger, this foreigner. Where are the nine? Have you ever had someone call you just because they need you for something? Have you ever had someone call you, you give them something, and, and then you never hear from them again? It's like you give them a kidney. I heard of a, a fan that had given a celebrity a kidney, and then after the celebrity got the kidney, the fan never heard from the celebrity again. Disrespectful. Can you imagine how Jesus felt? Disrespected unappreciated, gimme, 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 save me, save me, save me. Prayers of petition, but no prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Where are the nine? That's the question. Unfortunately, the nine are lost. If you're not with Jesus, then you're lost like the lost coin and the lost sheep, like the lost son who never returned to the father, lost. It's like sitting in the pews without Jesus. When Jesus is speaking, people's on the phone chatting to God knows who. Lost in church. The lepers their ingratitude closed off their hearts to the grace of God. And here's, a, here's another question that came to mind. Why did Jesus ask the question? Jesus is asking the disciples in the presence of the one leper that came back. He's asking them, where are the nine? Jesus is all knowing. He knows where the nine are. So why is he asking the disciples, where are the nine? Am I my brother's keeper? You are your brother's keeper. The song says, seeking the lost, yet kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the master spoken today. We have a responsibility to know where the nine are. It doesn't mean getting into the business. But we have a responsibility to seek out the nine. Maybe that one leper, as he returned to, to give thanks to Jesus, maybe he should have asked the other nine to come. Maybe that's why he was asked the question. He has a responsibility, respectfully, to seek the loss. We have a responsibility to seek the loss. I'm not up here saying that I've mastered Thanksgiving, but I'm, I need Jesus like, just like you do. All of us are guilty of being the nine at one point in our lives. All of us are guilty of being one of the nine. 
Sometimes I feel like I have to hold on so tight to Jesus because I know myself. I got I to gotta hang on by my, my fingernails because if I let go, I know the devil will crush me like a jelly bean. I have to hold on tight. And Jesus, I'm not going to let you go. Jesus says, let go. I can't let Jesus go. In verse 19, and he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. Oh man, every time I see the word arise in the Bible, big things that happen. Actually, if, if I could change the title of this, talk, uh, this sermon, I would call it Arise. But we're keeping with the title, Where Are the Nine? But the theme I like to go with right now is arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. Arise, all, all throughout the Bible, the blind man, Jesus said to the blind man, arise, pick up thy bed and walk. He said to Jairus, his 12-year-old daughter that was dead, he said, damsel, I say unto you, arise. He said to the leper, arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. Amen. Arise. And for God to tell you arise, that means you have to be on the ground. Your calves of your leg have to be parallel to the ground with your face at Jesus' feet. It's interesting. One leper, he was healed and gave thanks. But what if you're not healed? The Apostle Paul, he prayed three times. He said, God, he said, God, take this from me. Take this from me. And three times, God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. If God doesn't heal you of your cancer, of, of your health issues, is his grace still sufficient for thee? Can you still give God thanks if you have not been healed physically? The Apostle Paul, he asked a question. He said, for the good that I would, I do not, and the evil which I would not, that do I. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Who shall deliver me from this body of leprosy? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus, our Lord. The answer was Jesus. Robert Lowry in 1876, he was a, a publisher, he was a professor, he was a, a preacher, he was a gospel hymn writer. He said, what can wash away my sins? And the answer was nothing but the blood of Jesus. The Apostle Paul and this guy, Robert Lowry, they both asked him the same question. The Apostle Paul said, who shall deliver me? The answer is Jesus. The writer says, what can wash away my sins? It points back to Jesus, the blood of Jesus. The song goes on to say, what can make me whole again? What can make me whole again? And Jesus answers the question in Luke chapter 17 and 19. He says, arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Thy faith in me has made you whole. Thy thanksgiving in me has made you whole. Thy gratitude in me has made you whole. Arise, church. It's time for healing. Arise, Seventh-day Adventists, and be advocates of the truth. Arise. Arise. Arise, beloved. Arise. Amen. amen, amen, amen. And as we continue, we will look at Luke 17, verse 15 and 17 once more. Verse 15 says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. 
Now, I know sometimes in our church, there are people who glorify God a little differently. And I'm so happy that our speakers already let you know exactly what leprosy was. And if you had leprosy and you were healed and you came here, I'm sure you would be like this leper glorifying God. So sometimes we are in church and we see people lifting up holy hands and praising God. And probably it sounds a little different from we are used to. But don't bother them because you don't know where God has brought them from. And sometimes when I think of the goodness of Jesus myself, and what he has done for me. My soul cries out hallelujah. And there will be others who are crying out hallelujah. Allow them to worship the way God impresses them. In verse 17, and Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Which is what we are talking about. Where are the nine? Do you like hanging around ungrateful people? Probably not. At home, and uh, probably my wife is watching and my children, I'm not talking about them. <laughs> but you do the laundry, you do the bedroom, you do the dishes, you do the lawn, you do the car, you do everything that you possibly can, and you miss one minor detail. And somehow, that is the focus of attention. Do we have anybody like that here, husbands, wives? Or probably even at work, you get to work, you are the first to get to work, you probably are the last to leave there. You do so much during the day, but you forget one minor thing, and that becomes the focus of attention by your supervisor. And out in the community, you have doctors, you have lawyers, you have teachers, you have fire officers, and so many, and you do so much for the community. And it seems like it's a thankless job because sometimes you just can't seem to do enough. But I'm here to invite you, to encourage you to be thankful because what, that's, what God in, in, that's what God requires of us. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. And it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Can you imagine someone always giving thanks? In fact, won't you adopt that? Won't you try that? Probably you were in town, and most of us do drive, but you were in town, and the bus leaves you somewhere in town, and you are giving God thanks. Sometimes you hear the bus was in an accident or it broke down. Then you realize what God was doing for you. Or probably you were diagnosed with cancer, but yet you are giving God thanks. Your children have forsaken you, yet you are giving God thanks. You went through a bitter divorce, yet you are giving God thanks. You were placed in a rest home or threatened to be placed in a rest home when you get old, yet you are giving God thanks. And you are laughing. My daughter actually told me to look for a rest home that I like. <laughs> but we need to be thankful. Yes, that's what God encourages us to do in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. And may I ask you, what are you thankful for? The Apostle Paul was a great example of a person who gave thanks in all circumstances. In fact, he was bold enough to thank God for his infirmities. It's not only in the good times that we must thank God, but in the bad times as well. Nothing turns us into bitter, selfish, dissatisfied people more quickly than an ungrateful heart. And mind you, nobody likes to stay around you if you're like that. And maybe that's why people avoid you and don't take your calls. And equally true is the fact that nothing will do more to restore contentment and the joy of our salvation than a spirit of thankfulness. These ten lepers, they approached Jesus pleading, and you heard how despicable that disease was. They approached Jesus and they asked to be cleansed, and Jesus cleansed them, and only one came back. Do you have any ungrateful people in your life? Maybe a husband, a wife, a child, a friend, a relative, a colleague? It doesn't matter how much you do for these people. They still expect you to do more. They just seem never to be satisfied with what you do. Just recently, I was in the supermarket and I saw a lady. She was searching her purse, trying to pay for her grocery. And I realized she wouldn't be able to pay because I actually know her. And I decided to go up to the cashier and offer to pay. And just to be polite, I asked the lady, is there anything else you would like? She said, yes, I would like a chocolate as well. 
And I said, okay, is that all? He said, no, I was thinking of getting some donuts as well. <laughs> and I was just trying to be nice and to be respectful. So when I looked at her, because she wasn't the smallest person around, so I said, I think you can do without the donuts for today. And I paid because by this time, she's, I promised she needed everything in the store just because I'm paying for her. Just never satisfied. Today, ingratitude is far too common. Our children forget to thank their parents. Our spouses forget to thank each other. And employers forget to thank their employees. We just take it for granted. We take each other for granted, but we need to learn to say thanks. I make it a habit each time my wife cooks a meal to tell her thanks. And I just warned her that if I don't say anything, it's not because I've forgotten, so don't ask. We need to learn to say thanks. Above all, thank God for him blessing us each day. We are alive, we are here, we are seen, we are hearing. Despite what is happening, you may have lost a loved one, you may be sick, but God has done so much for you. Don't forget that he woke you up this morning and he got you on your way here to praise him and to rejoice. Can I have somebody praising God for what he has done? God has been good to us. You may be discouraged at times because you aren't doing well. You may feel defeated maybe because your family have forsaken you. But I'm going to encourage you to be thankful because God is always there for you. Let's be thankful even when we feel challenged, when we feel discouraged. In fact, your situation needs to be, you need to be thankful to God in your situation, whatever it is. In fact, Paul wrote in Colossians 3 verse 15, Colossians 3 verse 15, he says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. In sickness and in health, be thankful. In poverty or in wealth, be thankful. In summer or in winter, in sunshine or in rain. How many people are thanking God for the rain today? We need to be thankful. God expects us as Christians to be thankful. When you have Jesus, there's no need to be discouraged. And I like in 1905, Sevilla Martin penned these words, Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. He watches you. And if you have any doubt that he cares, the chorus of one of our favorite hymns says, Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares because his heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. I know he cares about you and he cares about me. I know he loves you and he loves me. I know we will see each other through by supporting each other in our difficulties because we know life throws challenges at us here and there. But when Christ is in the vessel, we can all smile at the storm. Now, what should we be thankful for, you may ask, and you have heard so many of her testimonies earlier, which were all a part of the sermon, even though it wasn't planned. But what should you be thankful for? You may be sitting there just thinking that nothing is going right in your life. You are sick, you are forsaken, you are broke, you are lonely. Well, please allow me to share a few as we close shortly. We need to thank God for the material blessings. God has blessed us so richly. We have food, we have clothes, we have somewhere to stay. And God has blessed us with friends, everything, so much. And even if you don't have what you want, Paul reminded us in Philippians 4 verse 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am. Therewith, learn to be content. A spirit of thankfulness makes all the difference in your life. We need to thank God for the people in our lives. And most, if not all of us, are blessed with wonderful people around us. We need to give thanks for those around us, our spouses, our children, our relatives. Don't look at what's wrong with them. Look at what's right with them. And thank God for their presence 
Then we need to thank God for the trials in our lives, and we heard that a little earlier. But Paul said in James 1, verses 2 and 3, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work with patience. I don't know what trials you may be going through right now, and I, I'm looking down on some of us, and I do know that we are going through different challenges. But I want you to know that God is expecting us, even in our trials, even in our challenges, to still praise him, to still call on his name. Cultivate a spirit of thankfulness, even in the midst of trials and heartache. In 1974, Chuck Fulmore, his 13-year-old daughter, was diagnosed with leukemia. And he ended up in the hospital a few years after himself with a ruptured disc. And while he was there feeling sorry for himself, just moaning and groaning in the hospital room, and I must advise you, I don't attend pity parties. If I come to see you, that's not what I'm there to do. I'm there to cheer you up. And sometimes, I think I said it before, but if I'm sick and in the hospital, and I've never been hospitalized yet, which is good, but if I'm sick and I'm there, I'm going to tell the nurses I don't need any visitors. Not because I don't want you to come, but I don't want the wrong person to come there and to get me depressed more than I am. You need to, if you go to the, if you go to the hospital to visit someone, why are you there crying more than the person? You're there to cheer the person up. And then it's worse, you tell them, this is what killed my mama last year. No. So that's why I don't want certain people to come to visit me when I'm there. So if you hear I'm not accepting visitors, just look for a private message from me because I will need you to come, but just not everybody. We need to be encouraging to each other. But here are the words that a nurse brought into the room to him. It says, there are trials in life that seem more than I can bear. There are heartaches beyond compare. Without trials in life, I might never bow in prayer, and I would never know Jesus really cares. Without those trials that you are trying to avoid, you will never prove Jesus, and he asks you to prove him. God is looking for Christians who live in an atmosphere of praise and thanksgiving, an atmosphere where our circumstances will not dictate our happiness. An atmosphere where even when you are going through the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, you will say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, did you know that thanksgiving brings contentment? The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. When Paul wrote these words, I want you to know that he was actually in prison. So your circumstances don't have to dictate your happiness. We may not get to heaven on a bed of ease, and I want you to know that some people have great trials, while some you may look at them and it seems as if they are going through on a bed of ease. But I want you to know that the Lord is with you on your journey, and he's going to see you through, whether in the good times or in the bad times, he's going to see you through. Always remember, our bad experience can produce good outcomes. You remember the story of Joseph, don't you? He was thrown into prison after he was sold into slavery. He was lied upon all before he became prime minister. God has a plan for your suffering. You need to know that your bad experiences are preparing you for your next blessing or it's preparing you for your next assignment. Let's learn to be more thankful, especially during our seasons of distress and grief. The Bible says in Romans 8, verse 28, and I want us all to believe this, that, and we know that all things work together. It says all things, not the good things only. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Regardless of what is happening, as I close, we can and should be thankful. Finally, don't forget to be thankful when all is well. Because that's the difficult part for us. Sometimes without the bad situations, we never pray. We never call on God. And it's unfortunate that I was told here once that we in the Caribbean seem to have more need for God. We are more genuine in our worship because of our poverty. We must depend on God. And I've never appreciated being poor that before I've heard that. 
then I really, as Paul, thank God for his infirmities. I thank God for my upbringing, my poverty, so that I can learn to depend on God. Because God is there for you in the good times and in the bad times. And it doesn't matter how God has blessed you. I don't want you to think that you have enough, that you don't need God. Because God woke you up this morning. God wakes you up every morning despite of what you think you have. And God can take it from you in a moment. God can put you on your back in the hospital. And if you don't believe me, he can put you in the grave. Go to any of these graveyards that you see. I assure you, it's not only poor people that are there. In fact, most of them here in Bermuda are not even from the Caribbean. They are right here from Bermuda. They have money. They are wealthy. But it's not everything that money can buy. Let us learn to depend on God. Because he wants us to depend on him. He wants us to look up to him. He wants us to thank him in all our circumstances. And as I wrap up now, as I close, I just have two simple appeals. As you look in your life today, do you know of anyone that you need to thank God for? Anyone, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a husband, a wife, or a child, anyone that you know, a colleague, anyone that you need to thank God for. If there's anyone that you need to go and thank God for and to thank them as well, just let me see your right hand. Amen, amen. And I'm going to invite you, if you live with that person when you go home today, or if you are sitting beside them now, just thank them for what they have done for you and for their support in your life. And then finally, we need to thank God, each of us. We need to thank God for what he has done for us. But perhaps, because he sent his son to die to save each of us. I don't know if perhaps you are out there watching or you are here and you have not accepted Jesus as your savior. You have not accepted him as your personal Lord. Is there any such person who would want to give your life to Christ today or even to ask us to help you to prepare or to study the Bible with you or even to pray with you? Is there any such person who wants to accept Christ today or even to start the journey? Let me see your right hand. And if you are out there or if you are too uncomfortable to raise your hand, I'm going to invite you anyhow to reach out to us here at Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church and we will help you start this journey because Christ wants to save each of you. In the process though, let us all be thankful to God. Sister Simons to introduce uh, the candidate that's in the pool at this time. We have Kalani Smith, and we'd like to ask her parents, or her mother's there, uh, her nana, any family and friends can stand. Those supporting her, her classmates from school, and her teacher. And we have uh, three of students, classmates, that are going to come and give Colleen his favorite scripture. It's Lara, Layla, and Alexia. Good morning, church. Now we will be citing Colleen's favorite verse, John 3.16. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen. We'll invite the family, uh, especially close families. Who would like to come closer and get right up about the pool, take pictures? That's fine. We invite you to come close at this time. Poor lady. Lady's been coming down to the altar for a couple of years now, uh, and she's been looking forward to this day of her baptism, and we are delighted for her. Can the church say amen? amen. Now, lady, because of your love for the Lord Jesus Christ, because you have determined in your heart that one day you want to walk on streets of gold, you want to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, and you want to worship at the feet of Jesus. It gives me great pleasure as a minister of the gospel to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Let the church of the living God say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, as the Spirit of God descended upon your Son, as he was there in the Jordan, I beg that you would send your Spirit again to fall afresh on Lady, fill her with power to live a life victorious in you. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. 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 In the pool right now, we have our grandson in the pool right now, um, Caden Tuzo. Caden is the son of Sean, standing here in his nice bright colors. Sean Tuzo and his mom in her Pathfinder uniform. I saw her just now, yes, right here. We have lots of family and friends here. Um, and great, great aunt is here as well. So many wonderful people who are in support. And those of you who are in the audience, if you want to stand um, to give support, we also have uh, great aunts uh, watching online, and they want you to know, Caden, they're praying for you, and they have great expectations of you, and you have been a great help in guiding them toward Jesus. And we also want to thank uh, our students and the teachers at Bermuda Institute. We want to thank... Um, Sabbath school teacher for reminding him he, where he needs to be every Sabbath, and uh, also thank the parents, of course, in their best uh, ability they're doing to bring him in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Right now, Caden is asked if his dad would please read a very special text. Okay. Caden's special text is Psalms 23, and he said that David is one of his most favorite characters in the Bible. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me by, beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. amen. Can the church say amen? amen? I don't know. I see 
that there's so many friends up here that I don't know if his parents will be able to get a look. I know they want to get a little closer, uh, but I, I don't know if you need your own cameras up here, but we welcome his parents to come as close. Oh, okay, somebody else is taking care of that for you. Absolutely. Uh, it's an absolute joy to do this. As you know, uh, again, these candidates today are a product of the combination of the home, the church, and the school. Can the church say amen? amen. There are a couple of members here. Uh, of course, our principal, a member of this congregation is here. Uh, but I see, looks like, is that the PE teacher? I think I see back there. God bless you. God bless you, man. So glad you're here to support these kids. They look up to you. It's glad to have you here. But we are blessed to be in this place, the Dow Caden, because of your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because uh, you want to be like the rest of your family, going up yonder when Jesus calls us home. Because one day you want to eat from the tree of life, drink from the water of life, uh, and wear a crown of life. It gives me great pleasure as a minister of the gospel to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost, let the church of the living God say hallelujah. hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray together. Spirit of the living God, we beg even now that you will come mightily upon Caden. You have a plan for his life. You have already laid it out. May he stick with you that your plans may be fulfilled in him. May he always be an overcomer and always be one that holds fast to the man we call Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen, amen. amen. None but the righteous. None but the extend at a baptism. Perhaps there's somebody else out there that would like to be in the next baptism. You'd like to be prepared to be in the next baptism. We want to invite you just to raise your hand right now. I see you young fellas, always the little ones that lead the way. Is there anybody else that would like to be in the next baptism? Wherever you are, just raise your hand. Just, I see you. I see. God bless you. God bless you. Young fella. Is that, is that your son, Mal? Uh, it's good to see, good to see Brother Jamal Warren in the house. Can the church say amen? His son wants to be in the next baptism. We got to make sure he's ready, Mal. We got to make sure that he is ready for his baptism. Hey, listen, let us, I see you, I see you guys. I see those two hands over there. God bless you, God bless you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's have a prayer for these uh, persons that have chosen Christ today. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much. We're so thankful on this Thanksgiving Sabbath for your goodness and your grace and for the four or five more individuals that said they want to be in the next baptism. Bless them, Father. Bless also those who are in the master class right now. Father, be with them. Bless their hearts. Continue to subdue them that they also can be a part of the baptism. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Please stand as we sing our benediction song. Bless this house.
Time is far spent, but if you just permit me just for a couple of minutes just to say a big thank you to our three elders for the spoken word today, Elder Kim, Elder Mark, and Elder Corville. Thank you so much. And I just want to say that I am one of the happiest person today because two of my students, Kalani and Kaden, got baptized today. So we pray that God will continue to guide them on this journey as they give their lives to him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful for this opportunity once more to be in your presence. We're thankful, Lord, for the word that we received today. But even more than that, Lord, we are grateful and thankful that we were here to witness two of your own who have given their lives to you. We pray, loving Father, that as they begin this journey with you, your Holy Spirit will continue to walk with them, guide them, protect them. And Lord, when you come, it is my prayer, Lord, that all of us here today will make it into your kingdom. Be with us even now as we leave. Grant us your presence. Journey in mercies, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated until ushered out. Lord, I lift, Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh! 